Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome to the program. It is February 27th, 2024, and you are locked in to the Jeff Gersman Show. I'm Jeff Gersman, hosting this week's installment of the program. Happy to be here with you uh, to talk about whatever the heck is happening in the world of video games, as, as much as there is still a world. Uh, it so feels like it's shrinking by the day sometimes i don't know i suppose that depends on which metrics you're using revenue is looking fantastic um oof, yeah i don't know it's a it's a weird like yes this morning a a big old batch of sony layoffs that we will get into of course um ed is now available ed is now available. That's the headline on the Steam update for Street Fighter 6. I know Ed is not new. I know Ed was in uh, the previous game. There's just something weird. Is it, maybe it's just such a short name. Like maybe he, he just he needs a full name. If uh, he needs a last name, I, I feel like to in order to work. There's just something about like ed and i don't, I don't mean that there's no uh, i don't that's i think ed is a fine name edward eddie you know ed whatever um that's not you know, you know i'm not i'm not throwing shade at real life people who are named ed but i think on its own in the world of fighting well whatever this is the fighting game franchise that brought us ken so maybe i maybe that's maybe ed is actually a really good fit now that i think about it yeah we got dan we got ken we got ed we got e but then you got you know i don't know you got, you got your i guess ryu is not it's not yeah is, is that the is ryu the ed of japan uh yeah um so so maybe that's not that weird but there's just something about the headline, Ed is now available. Oh, let me, can I book an appointment with Ed? My shoulders are real tight. If Ed's available, I would love to. Does he, does he have Wednesdays? I've got, a, uh, I've got a spot on the back of my leg that's been really bugging me. It feels like a cramp that's about to cramp. But it hasn't cramped yet, if you know what I mean. And so if, if Ed could just like get back there and just beat the crap out of it, um, I would really appreciate it. That'd be... That'd be fantastic if uh, if if Ed is is available. Um, I spent well. I I you know I will ad I will admit that I, I I do need to spend a little bit more time with it just as a due diligence sort of thing. Um, but I did spend a little bit of time over the weekend with Skull and Bones, a Ubisoft original as it says under the lo under the game's logo on the title screen and and on their late title card and all of that stuff uh skull and bones is available if you want to play it it is it, it is shipped it appears to be a video game um i had a i had a bad time <laughs> i i not the intended experience, I'm guessing, but like, so I, you fire it up. Um, there's a brief moment where you're in a boat and you're shooting other boats. And then that leads to a shipwreck and you're like, oh no, we, now we don't have a boat, you know, kind of an abilities sort of thing. Um, but they basically, you end up on a tiny boat with two other people and you're trying to scavenge what's left of from the shipwreck of, of everything that happened. Your pirate fleet got knocked out or whatever. And you're trying to find your way 
to some kind of pirates that they keep calling it it's a pirate's paradise <laughs> but they don't talk enough like that there's not enough like this the pirates started it. i feel like the game i would feel a lot better about the game if everyone in it just talked like a stereotypical fake fucking pirate like i think that would be a better vibe for the game overall um instead of this lady going like I think you could be our captain. You could be our, you know, you should take control of the boat and you should do this. And I think just as I got a feeling about you, it was just like the weirdest, like, oh, you're the going to be the savior of this whole thing and, 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 and whatever else. Um, so they have, you need to figure out how to get to this, uh, to St. Anne. I think St. Anne, the, the pirates, the, the aforementioned, the pirates paradise. Um, And you don't know where it is. And so there's a guy who's like an officer and he's wearing a fancy jacket. And, you know, like all the other guys are just like punching. Like you get to this little island where everyone who survived the shipwreck is. And everyone is just like punching each other and dancing and just like having like a good, weird, chaotic time. And it's just like, oh, all these all these guys think that they're just going to die here. So whatever. They're just they're just drinking all this rum and whatever. But I ah, what are we going to do? And so you talk to this officer guy and he's like, oh, you, okay. You look like maybe you have your shit together and oh, well, why don't you go out there and recover some of the cargo and then bring it back. And then I'll tell you where the, the, the directions to this pirate's paradise. And then you go out there and you like, um, pick up some boxes. Like you, you loot the water, (laughs) you go out there and you loot the water. Um, as you're sailing around, it'll, it'll just pop up. There'll be boxes out there and it'll be like, do you want to take this? And it's like, yeah, give me this plank or give me this rum. Give me these exotic weapons or whatever it is you're, you're getting for this first quest. And so you, you go out there and do it and there's like sharks and you can throw spears at the sharks. You don't, you know, there's no cannons on your boat. Uh, so you just like you left trigger, right trigger your way into throwing spears at fish. And you can catch the fish and cook them and eat them and get a stamina bonus for your boat. Uh, anyway, you get, you know, you get your boxes and bring it back to the guy and then he's just, you know, and so it's like, whatever, it's the story. But at the same time, there's something about the way that this moment was presented that really like has, has almost unfairly perhaps, but it has defined skull and bones for me quite well. You bring this guy, the stuff and he goes, I'm not going to tell you nothing. Fuck off. <laughs> it literally says fuck off. And then you're like, okay, cool. I guess I got to run back to my boat now. And so there's a, there's a point on the Island that is a little pole in the ground. And that's when you walk there, a prompt appears that says disembark. And then you walk over to that and you hit the button and then you, you know, it teleports you onto a boat and then you're, you're going. Um, and so this man told me to fuck off and I went, well, okay, all right. And fuck off, fuck me, I guess. All right. And then I walked over to the spot where I'm supposed to get back on my boat and the prompt wouldn't show up. So I was just like trapped on this Island. Uh, you can also hold down the button, uh, the disembark button to like warp back to your boat from anywhere when you're not on the boat, I guess. And that also didn't work. I was basically trapped on this Island, unable to leave. Um, fuck off, I guess. Thanks, Skull and Bones. Uh, my gut feeling was to stop right there and never play Skull and Bones again, but instead I, I force quit the game and then relaunched it. And then I was able to get back on the boat and then you quickly find a way to the pirate's paradise sire. And then from there, it becomes like tutorial type shit of just like, well, if you want a boat, you're going to need to build one. I can build the best boats in the land. And I would love for you to be a big pirate. And and if you were going to be a popular pirate, it cool would be cool if you were on one of my boats. And then, um, but you're going to need tools. And then the guy next to him is the tools vendor. And so you walk over to the tools vendor and start and open up that shop window. And he says, ah, oh, yeah, it would really build a big name. If you, I built, if you had my tools on your boat, here's, I'm going to give you the things you need to get the starter tools, but you're going to need some tree branches. If you want to build a bigger, so like, you know, you're there on this, like completely fucked boat that has no cannons on it. No, nothing. 
Um, and it's like, okay, well, you know, I guess we got to build a boat if we want to be a pirate. Um, and then like the first mission after that is like, now look at your map and figure out where the, tr I I'm going to give you these tools. Now you need to go harvest trees and you need to get back on your boat and sail to where the trees are and cut them. And I was like, dude, what the fuck? I don't, I don't want to do this. <laughs> Like, what the fuck are we, what the fuck are we doing? Um, but you know, like you go through the, the, that area, the, the kind of social, it's the social hub for the game, right? It's, it's, you know, the, the pirates, the pirates paradise, um, the pirates paradise where your character stash be in case you, ye not win, be wanting to put all of your gear on your boat or move it, move it over to the chest. Does ye want to be spending premium currency on some cosmetics? Arr! Um. And so that was that. I don't know. Like I, <laughs> at that point, between the glitches and and all of that other stuff, I kind of had my fill of it for a little bit. And but you know, it's it is. It's we it's weird, you know, when you're piloting a boat and sinking other boats and stuff, like you are holding down the left trigger and, and pulling the right trigger to shoot, and then there's reload times for each quadrant of your boat. So if you can turn uh fast enough and face get the other side of your boat facing your enemy, then you can shoot again immediately. So there's this incentive to kind of always be twisting and turning to sort of get around on your enemy, but also, you know, make sure that the loaded cannons are facing them and, and so on and so forth. And then you have like, you push A to go and B to stop, but then if you push A again while you're going, you will trim the sails and then a separate meet, like a literal stamina meter pops up that is like, okay, you can do this for a little while, but you can't, you know, you can't, you can't go fast forever. You can't, you're, you don't have infinite run speed on your boat. And I'm like, I, <laughs> okay, okay. I don't know, man. Like, what are we doing? Um, and there's other players like in the, in the water around you and stuff when you're doing those first missions. And you, if you look at them, a, you know, a little banner with their name appears on their head. And it's just like, all right, it's, it's, why does everyone have the Ubisoft logo next to their name? I think it's because they're on Uplay and not on a console because it does have cross play. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's it's uh it's very silly. Um and like I said, there is a certain amount of due diligence involved where I probably do need to go get those fucking trees and build that fucking boat and get out there and, and do a little something, but um it just there's there's the the concept of like okay you're gonna be dressed in rags and oh if you gain enough infamy you will unlock the ability and you'll un unlock the grind currency to buy some of this clothing but these eye patches are expensive because you know we don't want anyone to just like get an eye patch i mean that's uh, if you could get an eye patch in the first hour then uh, you know well, then what would we be doing you need to progress so thus you must grind out your eye patch or pay us a, 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 you know, a certain amount of, if you, you know, if you have a certain amount of real money that you could turn into this, uh, I believe is literally called pieces of eight. I believe that is the, the premium currency. Um, no, there's, there's three currencies. There's like, there's a grind currency. There's a paid currency that I think might just be gold. And then I think pieces of eight might be like a, a PVP or some kind of other honor based whatever it is man i don't know like it was just like it's the the different systems thrown in your face out of the gate and how those map to so many other video games is just i'm just like looking at it going like ah yeah all right yeah i i guess like but but it, it it's it's almost painfully straightforward especially for a game that's been in development for as long as it has like there's certain aspects to it to where you're just, you just kind of nod your head and go like yeah this is about what i figured this would be uh out of the gate anyway um so like i said i i you know i should spend a little bit more time with it before you know like i don't i don't want to be fully dismissive of it uh on the discord it sounds like some, some people are having like okay times with it and uh 
and saying that it's, you know, that it's got something going for it, but just the end game is, is like pretty barren. Um, I think that's been kind of a bit of the consensus around it is it's just like, here's this kind of like middling thing. And if you like numbers popping out of boats and, and all that, like there's, there's that. So, um, but yeah, I, I, uh, after all these years, um, after all these years of skull and bones being in development, um, it, it's, it, you know, th there's been a bit of talk. I think it was, you know, people who were literally on the team for the game kind of saying this, uh, you know, anonymously, of course saying like, Hey, yeah, this is like a decent 30 or $40 game. But of course they want, you know, 70 for it. They'll, they'll happily take more than 70 for it. Uh, for some versions of the game. Um, and yeah, yeah, man, it's, uh, weird. It's a weird thing. Um, I spent a bunch of time playing a game called Lodge Art Grimoire. Which is on Steam. I believe it may also... You know, it's in early access. So I think it maybe hasn't come to other platforms just yet. Um, but this game actually came out uh, back in September. And it is from the Jupiter Corporation. And that's the company that makes all those Picross games on Nintendo platforms. Your, your Picross E9 and E8. You know, all that sort of stuff. Um... And so, uh, it is a Picross game. They, I think and Nintendo, I believe owns the term Picross. And so they don't use that. No one else uses that term. Um, but they have made a pretty good Picross game here as, as the Jupiter corporation is wont to do. And they have created a little element to it where it, it has a, uh, they, they put some crafting in it. So you got to, you, okay, you punch these pick crosses and then wood comes. No, uh, it, there is a, a, a minor bit of, yes, nonograms, I think is the, the, the non protected, the non copyrighted term for this style of puzzle. Um, some of the puzzles are locked and some of the puzzles are what they call fundamental puzzles. And so you'll, you'll do a, a pick cross puzzle and it'll be fire or a tree or water or wind. And so you're creating these different elements and then almost in a doodle God like fashion, you can then put the elements together and that will unlock additional puzzles, but it's not, you don't just put them together willy nilly. Like you, you read a riddle for a locked puzzle and it'll, it's a, not a difficult riddle. It'll highlight the words of exactly what you're kind of looking for. The clues are not difficult to figure out, at least in the early going of like, oh, if I put together wood and, uh, fire here, then it will unlock this puzzle. And then you, you unlock the next puzzle or next few puzzles and move forward. It's an interesting little kind of inserted mechanic into what would otherwise just be a fat list of Picross puzzles. Um, but yeah, it's in early access. It's 13 bucks. And, uh, if you're in the mood for Jupiter's particular brand of Picross and you don't necessarily want to do it on the switch where there's a ton of it, <laughs> um, already that is on steam, uh, Logic art grimoire, not logic art, Logic art. Hey. I don't, I don't come up with the names. I'm going to look and see what they say about their early access. Um, implementation of a tutorial screen. Yeah. Uh, the main game picture logic puzzle is fully playable with all the puzzles available. So it, the, I don't know what they're, I, I mean, I don't know what they're looking for feedback on, on the early access stuff. In the section called Fusion, we focus on checking for any unsolvable problems and making enhancements to create a better experience. So it seems like the stuff outside of outside of the Picross is the stuff where they are looking to get some feedback and get some, you know, and, and build some additional stuff. Um, 
and it's Steam Deck verified, so that's nice if you're looking for for that sort of thing. But yeah, I don't know. It's um, hey, sometimes you need a little pick cross in your life. I found myself needing some pick cross in my life. I know that they're gonna bring another big batch. Of, I think it's like all the stuff that came out on 3DS as downloadable stuff. I think they are bringing to the Switch in one big collection, or rather a single purchase with a bunch of DLC added onto it for the rest of them or something. So, um, congratulations to the folks at Jupiter Corp for continuing to make some good ass pick Ross. Um, and I guess the other game worth talking about here is last epoch. <sighs> Last Epoch from 11th Hour Games is an action RPG. I had a handful of people, including a couple of folks on the Discord, uh, recommend it as like, hey man, if you're done with Diablo, here's an action RPG. Like, like that sort of, that's sort of been some of the talk around it. it it's been around a bit. It just, I think it just hit 1.0, right? I think they just either got out of early access or, or whatever they're doing. But, um, but that launched for realsies. Uh, and they've been having server issues and stuff. It seems like that it's been doing quite well since the launch on the 21st. Though, of course, recent reviews are mixed, much like Helldivers because of all the server issues and, and some of that other stuff. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, let's see. What's the lowest price for this? 35 bucks. They've got an Ultimate Edition that is 65 that comes with I don't know, the co the soundtrack and I don't know, it looks like a bunch of cosmetics. Um, it is an action RPG in the vein of Diablo 4. It's, uh, okay, this is, this sounds harsh and it, but it's maybe sounds a little bit more harsh to both parties. Last Epoch feels like a game it has got massive published by amazon games energy going on if you know what i mean in that it feels like it should be free to play it just feels like this it feels like a free to play game that kind of came out of nowhere and you're like oh all right um it's okay as I have felt about the games that Amazon has put out <laughs> lately, the, uh, whatever the fuck the other, uh, the blue, no, no, that's the one that's not out, right? Oh, uh, what the hell? La uh, uh, Last Ark? Is that the one? Lost Ark. Last Epoch, Lost Ark. It's totally different. Um, and New Worlds the, is the, yeah, that's the MMO, right? Um, Last Epoch... Um, as I kind of leveled it up and got my character going and started putting abilities into slots and started leveling, you know, there's mastery trees for some of the abilities. And so you can kind of arc those in specific directions and your character can branch in a few different ways. It is not like path of exile crazy. It is not some sphere grid nightmare to upgrade your character it is uh it is relatively easy to read um but it just feels funky it just it feels funky in a free-to-play way it feels like it's pushing cosmetics on menus in a free-to-play way but it's not free to play and so it, it's it's a game where when you walk to the edge of an area and maybe this is server related and maybe this will feel a little bit better now, if not soon. Um, it is a game that when you get to the edge of an area and it needs to load into another area, you stand there for a few seconds while it figures out what the hell it's doing. And your character is just standing there and you're like, what? And then it fades out and you're like, oh, okay, right. It just had to, just, it took a while for me to zone there. Um, and I don't know, man, it's, it's, uh, it feels absolutely serviceable i don't think I, I, yeah i don't know like so diablo 4 is a game i feel 100 percent done with um every time they update it every time they launch a new season i, I kind of you know I'll, I'll dip back in and look at it for a little bit and be like ah diablo and they're like oh yeah no 
when there's n proper new content in Diablo 4, like, hey, man, we put another act on the story uh, or, or like that type of update. And it's like, hey, here's a thing you can do with your main character and go and do this. And you're like, oh, OK, yeah, like that might be something that gets me to play Diablo 4 again. Because I like Diablo 4, but I don't like any part of their seasonal model. I don't like the things they've asked you to, like when the, when you start a seasonal character for all of their seasons and, and they're like, okay, now get here and do this. And here's the new system we cooked up. Like I, I haven't, none of that has been compelling to me at all. I thought the story and, and the, the progression through core main Diablo four was pretty good. I made my way through it and the character gets powerful. You build it the way you want and you're like, hell yeah. I don't know. I got a horse now. I, uh, this is cool. We're going to go fuck shit up. And then you fuck up shit up for like two hours. And then that's the end of the game. <laughs> like by the time you get to a point where you're really fucking shit up, uh, you're at the end. And then it's like, hey man, do you want to start a new character on the seasonal realm? I'm like, absolutely fucking not. No, not in a million years. I still don't want to do that. Every you, you, you keep putting out more seasons and I keep looking at them to go like, maybe this is the one. And, and no, it just, it has not had any draw whatsoever. Um, and so that's been disappointing. I don't know. Like I, 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 I loved Diablo three. I played a ton of Diablo three. Uh, and Diablo three was a game where I felt like it was okay for me to just kind of stick with the same character the entire time. Um, this feels, and, and obviously they did seasonal stuff in Diablo 3 as well, but like um, Diablo 4, it feels like oh, the just the main stuff of, the main crux of the game is built around you investing in their seasonal system, and I just don't want to do that uh, because I don't think that any of that content is good. It's, that's why. It's, it's not necessarily just starting over a character and, and so on and so forth. Like I, I'm, I'm against that just kind of conceptually as well, because the whole point of these games is I'm building the sickest character and, and I am attached to my sick character and we are going to keep leveling up and keep getting more powerful and keep stacking on crazier and crazier shit. And then when I get done with that, maybe I'll start a different character and then go and do that. Whereas like the seasonal stuff is more like, here's a character that's like, I don't know. It doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't feel like there's a ton of variety on a per character base. Anyway. So, I think that opens the door. It really, it really makes it, uh, you know, the, it opens the door for a game like last epoch to kind of, um, make some headway because I think you have a lot of people that are done with Diablo four that might be looking for another action RPG, or they might just be burned out on the genre and maybe it's the wrong time for them. But I, I kind of approached it like, yeah, yeah, I didn't get what I was looking for out of Diablo four. I did not get the full Diablo four experience. Or the, or the I did I didn't I didn't get it all out of me, but when I by playing Diablo four because I, I found myself wanting more. But Last Epoch also isn't really doing it for me either. It's just clunky enough on the interface end. It's just clunky enough on the comparing weapons end is not being as streamlined as maybe it could be. And it has decent controller support. So if you if you like playing action RPGs with a controller, like. You can, which, which I have, I have come to be that person. I suppose I, I didn't think that that was possible until Diablo three came to console. Um, so, so that works pretty well. I, I think, yeah, I don't know. I, there's it's definitely a certain type of person who really likes last epoch, but I'm just finding it to be so average across the board. And there's just something about the fit and finish of it that feels very, um, I don't know. Low budget is not in the words because that is that that is overly harsh, but it it just doesn't feel as smooth or as good. It doesn't look as good. It doesn't you know, it doesn't run as it's just every little aspect of it. I felt like, ah, this could be better. This should be better. This could be cleaner. This could yeah, this this aspect of the game should be handled better. It just has a Yes, and Chili Bus says it's got that Netflix look. Yeah, yeah, but not like a Netflix games look. It's it's like it's got that direct to video look. It's the it's the the Diablo knockoff that debuted on HBO or something and you're like, "Oh, okay." Um But yeah, I don't know. A certain type of person will be super super way into it. 
I'm sure, but I, yeah, I don't know. Like it, it's, it's not, it's not hitting for me the way I'd hoped it would. Um, but I will keep fucking with it because I just, I don't know. <laughs> because I, well, I, I feel like there's just not that much, I, I don't know. We're, we're, there's certainly plenty of games to be played and certainly plenty of games I could be playing more of. Um, but in terms of new games and moving forward into new games, it feels like there hasn't, you know, maybe it's kind of dropped off a little bit. Of course, Final Fantasy will be out, you know, was it tomorrow, this week, right? So, so that'll be a big thing for PlayStation owners. Um, Penny's big breakaway was kind of like, like dropped at the end of the Nintendo Direct last week we tried playing that on stream and it crashed as soon as i touched the first thing and i have it has not received a patch yet so i haven't gone back to it but i kept loading it up walking to the first like collectible object or whatever is going to teleport me into the first world or whatever like out of the hub and it just would crash to desktop every single time so that's my uh that is my full experience with penny's big breakaway maybe check it out on console if you're <laughs> If you're thinking about it. Because my understanding is that that version doesn't crash. Let's get into the news. We got some additional details on the supposed delay for the launch of the next Nintendo hardware. Let's just call it the Nintendo Switch 2 because that's just easy. Um, I think it would be a shame if they really called it that, but let's just, we can just call it that now because, hey, um, videogameschronicle.com is reporting via the Nikkei, uh, that they, that there's some sources over there. According to Nikkei, priority was given to ensure the initial inventory of the successor console and a lineup of software titles at the time of its launch. So basically... I believe VGC and some other sources were reporting last week that it was like, hey, they need time to get hardware ready. But this sounds like it is also they want to make sure they have enough consoles built to kind of avoid um, scalpers, resellers, like all of that stuff, which they won't. They won't be able to avoid that. But, um, but you know, if there are enough consoles on shelves, that will certainly help with that. Uh, with that part of things for sure. Um, that is the extent of the news. I, I think that checks out, honestly. That 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 makes a ton of sense. Um, Patrick in the chat says, do you think we will get a Switch 2 reveal this year still? Yes, yeah, so totally. Like, yes, they will. If, if they're going to ship in March, they can't, uh, they have to announce it sooner than that. They can't just announce it in January and then ship in March. Um, so I, I think, uh, yeah, maybe we end up seeing it in June or something like that around an E3 time frame. Maybe, maybe that would make sense for them. There's no reason all that why they would have to stick to a June without there being an E3 and, you know, summer games fest will certainly happen. And so that might be a, a place for them, but Nintendo has not participated in that directly. If I remember correctly. So I don't know if they will be there this year in any kind of more official capacity, uh, that would lead to them doing something like this, or if they just do some piggyback stream and just say like, "Hey, we're we're doing it in 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 March or or whatever." But they could very easily do it much later in the year than that if they wanted to. In fact, if they want to, like, it's a tricky thing, right? Because the minute you say you've got a new piece of hardware coming, uh, you are cutting off sales of the previous hardware because people will go, "Oh, there's a new one out real soon," and they will start to wait. That's probably already happening on, on the basis of all of these reports, but these reports have probably not hit a full-on mainstream audience to the extent that, that it would be hurt, hurting their sales. But, um, you know, they, they would love to get one more holiday, even of diminished Switch sales. They would love to have just like one more holiday of selling stuff. Uh, if they've got it right, that's kind of the other big if on this is, it, it, you know, if they're delaying the console from Q4 of this year into Q1 of next year, then 
they probably planned most of their resources and most of their development efforts around software for the new console, leaving their holiday potentially looking a little rough uh, if all of this stuff is getting pushed back to March. So if I were a Nintendo, I would be thinking about like, is there any kind of stopgap software that we've got waiting in the wings or something real quick we could do from a, a compilation standpoint or, you know, or a remaster standpoint is there, you know, but, but even now, like it's, it's almost March now. And so you would be talking about like a project that'd be like, what, six months to put it together. Like probably that, that's, that's probably impossible. It's always possible that they have another... Yeah, sure. Some people have speculated that maybe they've got another mini console waiting in the wings or something like that to to try to have something like that this year, much like they did with the NES Classic and the SNES Classic. I don't know what you do at that point. Do you do a Game Boy? I guess you could do a Game Boy Classic. That would be pretty cool. Here's a device. It's got 20 built-in games or something like that, but also... Uh, N64, yeah, people in chat are saying N64. That takes too much work. I think if you wanted to do a Game Boy, well, if you had to do a Game Boy, you'd have to source screens. And you'd have to, like, the, the hardware on that is kind of weird, too. But I feel like doing an N64... Doing an N64 Mini would require them to put together <clears throat> a device that could properly emulate N64 games. And that is something that, while largely done on the hobbyist side and all of that sort of stuff. And of course you can do it on the switch. Um, that still takes work to pull off. Um, but yeah, if they've been doing that work behind the scenes and thinking about stuff, sure, sure. It's just something that if they had to pull the trigger on something, you know, middle of last year or something when they realized, Hey, we, we got to figure shit out. Then, um, an N64 might be difficult to do in that time frame, but if it's something they've already been working on and planning for, you never know. Um, a Game Boy would be weird too. I don't know, like a, a a Game Boy Classic or you know a Game Boy Mini, whatever whatever you want to call it at that point. I think would be kind of a strange device. Um, but you could do it. You could do it. We'll see. Who knows? Maybe Metroid Prime 4 is still a Switch 1 game. And so maybe that will find its way onto shelves this year, right? I mean, I anything is possible. Um, speaking of anything being possible, we live, hey, we live in interesting times. And uh, there, this... We're about to tumble off into some uh, some negative industry news here, but before we get there, I just want to highlight this little bit from uh, on the PlayStation blog. They posted something about um, some upcoming games for PSVR two, and the individual games. I gotta say, uh, don't look especially interesting. What do we have here? The Wizards Dark Times. Col the Wizards hyphen Dark Times colon Brotherhood. Uh, Wanderer, the Fragments of Fate, Little Cities, colon, Bigger, which is a great name for a game. Uh, Zombie Army VR, and Arizona Sunshine 2 update, Soul Covenant. And that's it. No first party announcements in there, which if you... I've been following. I don't think there are any. Are there any announced upcoming first party PlayStation VR 2 games? Or have they just kind of said, all right, we'd we put it out there. Cool, man. But there is still something exciting here buried in here. It is just a sentence. It is just two sentences, rather. They say, uh, oh, they, they, they talk about these announcements and say, there's so much to look forward to. I don't know that I agree when it comes to PSVR 2. There are certainly some upcoming games. Anyway, let's get to the good part. Also, we're pleased to share that we are currently testing the ability 
for PSVR 2 players to access additional games on PC to offer even more game variety in addition to the PSVR 2 titles available through PS5. We hope to make this support available in 2024, so stay tuned for more updates. The PSVR 2 is a quality headset. It's a, it's a good device. It's comfortable. Uh, the controllers feel good, so on and so forth. Um, but the biggest problem with it is something where it's like, hey, uh, you can only play games that are coming out on the PS5, which, despite them saying there's so much to look forward to, I don't know that I agree with that. And at least it's not happening as rapidly as things happen on the PC. So if they can make the PSVR 2 headset work with PC games via Steam or, you know, whatever other VR platforms still exist on the PC. I guess you could still download the Oculus Store, right? That still theoretically exists, even if, even if they don't sell heads. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. Um, that could be cool. That would have been something that would have been a big deal around the launch of the of the device. If they had said that at launch, I think that would have been a difference maker out of the gate. Now I think, you know, we've got all of these months of seeing kind of not great support for the PSVR two, um, a decent little launch. And then, you know, some of the same games that you see other places and so on and, and and so forth. So I think if they had been said out of the gate, hey, this is something we we th we want to add PC support to it. It's just not there yet. I think that would have maybe helped back then. Um. But hey, uh, better late than never, I guess. I don't know. As someone who who has a PlayStation VR two headset and doesn't have a lot to do with it, uh, that would be cool if I could use that on a PC. I'll, I will be curious to see what form that takes. Uh, if it is something that you are plugging directly into a PC or if they're like, uh, we made it so your PC streams to the PS5. And, you know, because there's the people that were trying to hack the PSVR 2 had said that the only way you would be able to ever do it is if you had a video card that had a, US, a specific type of USB-C port on the back of it, which no one makes anymore. <laughs> um... So like two generations old NVIDIA hardware, I think, has uh, the USB port on there that you need. Um, and they have, yeah, it's been years since they've done that. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I Ideally, this is just a, still a single USB-C plug-in to a PC, uh, which is, you know, basically how a, a, a Quest does it you know you're not routing hdmi through it or anything weird like that um but we'll see i don't know maybe they, will they will they have to make a breakout box will they have to make some kind of device or will it just plug in and go i, I don't know you know sony's gonna know more about their device than the people trying to hack it do presumably so maybe they've got a way that it can just be a single plug into a pc and have it work because like i said that's how that's how Facebook's doing it. Um, so that's cool. I don't know. Haven't really had a, a lot of great reasons to to dig that headset out and plug it back in. Um, and it's a nice headset, quality wise, and and so on and so forth. So so again, like the ability to use it on a PC would be would be quite nice. So we'll see if they get there. All they're committing to is we hope to make this support available in 2024. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, in other PlayStation news, they are laying off 900 people. That's the number, right? Sorry. I, uh, They are going to be, this is, uh, there, there's been a handful of different, they have put up multiple posts out there about how they are doing this. 
This is uh, what I have here is Herman Holst's message that has been posted to the Sony Interactive Entertainment blog, not the PlayStation blog. Uh, they are going to be making cuts uh, around the world. So this there will be some people in Japan that will get hit by this. Uh, in the UK and Europe, they are looking at closing the London studio completely. So that's... Uh, That's a big, that's a big legacy PlayStation kind of name, kind of concept. The London studio, um, they will be laying people off at Gorilla and at Fire Sprite. Bloomberg has uh, subsequently reported. Uh, so g games have been canceled around this as well. Uh, and so some of the some of the news on those games have has been getting around. Bloomberg is reporting that the fire sprite team was working on a twisted metal online focused kind of servicey kind of game and that that has been canceled um in the united states insomniac and naughty dog will see cuts as well as the internal technology creative and support teams uh at kind of playstation's central operation um the Bloomberg report also says that uh, in addition to that Last of Us game that Naughty Dog pulled the plug on, um, that there was an online game based on Spider-Man that was also canceled recently, not necessarily as a part of these cuts, but but prior to these cuts. And someone's asking, they're downsizing Naughty Dog, why? Um, well, Naughty Dog was staffing up for a live service game that they're no longer making. So... You know, that's uh, potentially part of it, but the. So Holst gets into this a little bit, or at least tries to present some reasoning for it. Um, I'm trying to figure out where to start here. Uh, let's see. Let's. Uh, this this is in addition to some smaller reductions in other teams across PlayStation Studios. So that's not to say that it's just Fire Sprite, Gorilla, London Studio. That, like there will be stuff across the board. Wouldn't be surprised if Bend got hit in some way, uh, to some minor degree. Or, you know, Bungie already went through a round of layoffs, so presumably this would not hit them again. But um, but I assume that you know when these percentage based reductions come around, everyone ends up taking a little bit of it. Um, some more than others, but uh, generally speaking, it's rare that a team gets left fully uh, untouched by this. So let's see here. This is from, again, what Herman Holst has to say about it. He's the head of PlayStation Studios. Uh, our goal at PlayStation Studios has always been to make the best games for PlayStation fans, and our global community of studios represents some of the most creative and talented teams within the gaming industry. PlayStation 5 is in its fourth year and we're at a stage where we need to step back and look at what our business needs. At the same time, our industry has experienced continuing and fundamental change, which affects how we all create and play games. Delivering the immersive, narrative-driven stories that PlayStation Studios is known for at the quality bar that we aspire to requires a reevaluation of how we operate. Delivering and sustaining social online experiences, allowing PlayStation gamers to explore our worlds in different ways, as well as launching games on additional devices such as PC and mobile requires a different approach and different resources to take on these challenges. PlayStation studios had to grow. We've brought brilliant and successful studios into our family. We have invested in new technology and partnerships. We have recruited talent from across our industry and beyond, but growth ourself, but growth itself is not an ambition. PlayStation studios is committed to continually discovering ways to work together collaborating and combining our efforts to ensure that we are able to craft games that push the boundaries of play and deliver what you expect from us. We looked at our studios and our portfolio, evaluating projects in various stages of development and have decided that some of those projects will not move forward. I want to be clear that the decision to stop work on these projects is not a reflection on the talent or passion of team members. Our philosophy has always been to allow creative experimentation. Sometimes great ideas don't become great games, Sometimes a project is started with the best intentions before shifts within the market or industry result in a change of plan. 
I am deeply saddened to see talented individuals leave the company. I have so much admiration, appreciation, and respect for their work. And so on and so forth. So, listen. If you say your philosophy has always been to allow creative experimentation, presumably that would mean you have done the business work behind that to ensure that you are safely allowing for creative experimentation. If you are allowing people to creatively experiment and then laying them off because the market shifted, that is not you allowing for creative experimentation. That is you going, oh, this didn't work out. And then, okay, we got to, all right, let's make some cuts. Allowing for creative experimentation is giving teams the room to fail and saying, okay, well, what do you got next? Try something else next. Put, fitting that, if putting this in here, because this is all true, right? Sometimes great ideas don't become great games. Totally true. Sometimes a project is started with the best intentions before shifts in the market or industry result in a change of plan. Totally true. Absolutely 100% true. But to then marry that to say that you all, you always allow for creative experimentation as you are cutting these jobs, it's not true. That's just not true. You do not allow for creative experimentation because otherwise these teams would just be whether they're splitting up and getting spread across the different teams across the organization or, or, Hey, you know, okay, you guys go and, and try it again. If anything, the direction that the PlayStation studios have been moving in with the shuttering of some of, of Japan studio and some of the other things that have happened there over the years, it feels like there is much less room for creative experimentation. It feels much more like PlayStation is like, okay, we have got to focus on, we've, uh, we've, we've got to focus on the things that are doing well for us and also find a way to make those games for less money. And you know, all of the Spider-Man 2 leak and stuff that has been going around now for, for months. And like, of course, you've got other people like former PlayStation people like a Sean Layden who, you know, He's on the outside looking in now and, you know, the, the shots he's taking. I mean, he's not taking shots. He's, he's, I feel like he is telling it like it is, but also, you know, being a guy who was inside that organization, it's sort of a weird thing for, for him to be the guy doing that. Um, this, yeah, this, this is, uh, unfortunate obviously but i i i don't like like looking at this and, and then trying to say you know we always want to allow creative experimentation it's like okay well you, like you you put all these people out i mean was it a, a creative experiment to have fire sprite work on a twisted metal live service game after supposedly lucid games took a crack at it but because destruction all stars didn't land it got moved over like you know like the it doesn't sound that doesn't sound like I don't know. Um, this, uh, a question came in that, you know, we'll get to emails later, but like someone, someone wrote in and said, Hey, um, is it just a reality of the business right now that, that we need all these remasters? Is that just a reality of Sony's business that they, they need to, they need to resell these games as many different times as they can. I think increasingly the answer is yes. Um, I think when, when the games are costing that much money, they want to get as much as they possibly can out of them. And so naturally you would remaster the last of us again or, or whatever, you know, like you would do the second one, you know, like, like the, the things they have done, especially, especially with a property like that, that is hot from a different area you know, because of the success of the television show, you've got an influx of interest from people who maybe haven't played those games. And so remastering the last of us, I actually, and, and the last of us part two, I think that makes an absolute ton of sense just from the perspective of making sure those games are available for people who want to play them. Uh, especially people who don't already have a PlayStation because they may have watched the show and been like, Oh, well, Hey, this is, 
yeah, I, I want to get in on this. I want to check this out. And so they go out and they buy a PlayStation and then like, oh, I can't get Last of Us 1 because it's only, you know, like it makes sense for them to remaster th those games. Um, that's why they do that for as much as people give them shit for doing that as opposed to, yes, say, for example, a Bloodborne remaster. Um, the Last of Us has much more upside purely from a positioning of the IP standpoint of like, hey, you know, we have an opportunity here to sell to people that are already familiar with and interested in the IP. Uh, we need to make sure that they've got the, the best way to get it. And this is a way for us to market a new product and get it back out there and make sure that they buy a PlayStation 5 instead of just buying a PlayStation 4. So let's make sure that we've got those out there. Like it, that, that makes a ton of fucking business sense to me. I don't know. Um, Whereas, you know, yeah, a Bloodborne remaster, that would be cool. That'd be cool. They should, they should do that. But, um, I think that has much less upside. Just purely, just conceptually, you know, the, the sort of people that would be interested in one over the other. Like, I, I think Last of Us is a, is a chance to appeal to people who don't normally buy a PlayStation 5. Whereas Bloodborne will appeal to people who already played Bloodborne. Pretty simple. Um, so. Yeah, I, the, there's, there's little bits and pieces. You know, Jim Ryan was kind of the first name to make this announcement. He's obviously on his way out. Um, and so before he got out, they allowed him to be the hatchet man or for, forced him. He got to, he got to be the hatchet man for this. He got to be the face of these layoffs on his way out the door. Um, and also there's a tweet going around from like five days ago where at London studio, they had his retirement party. And so it's all these smiling faces and like, Oh, Jim Ryan's retired. Oh yeah. 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 It's like, is Jim Ryan just sitting there going like, this is fun. You're all you. I just packed up my desk. You all should do it too. Because he would have known at that point, right? I doubt that that's something that, even if he's on his way out and, you know, obviously there's the earnings call and everything else, like, you know, maybe this is something where Totoki comes in and finalizes it or something like that. But presumably by the time that party happened, I would have to imagine that Jim Ryan would certainly know most of what the cuts were going to be at that point. And so the idea that he's there at his own retirement party next to his studio that they're going to enter into like administration or whatever the UK terminology is for when you're going to lay a bunch of people off is gross. Double, triple gross. Um, you could just say, Oh no, I, well maybe you couldn't, I don't know. But you know, if, if, uh, if HR or the office manager, if someone comes and goes, Hey, we want to throw you a retirement party. Like, as he's sitting there going like, Oh shit. Fuck. Um, it's like, ah, no, I, no, I'm, I'm good. Well, maybe we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. We'll figure out a time later to, to do it. Find a way to push that off until after these cuts are out and then, and then, and then maybe don't do it. But, um, yeah, having, having that happen and then suddenly, Hey, by the way, we're looking to close this entire studio is real, real fucking nuts, real nuts. Just from a, like a, 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 a being a human standpoint, you know what I mean? Um, Supermassive Studios, uh, is also, or I'm sorry, Supermassive Games is looking to cut about 90 people from the company, uh, Bloomberg reported that there was an internal email informing 150 people that they were at risk of being cut, but I guess, you know, they're being in the UK. 
they go through that period of consultation and so on and so forth and and have to legally go through this process they can't it's not just at will they can't just say like oh by the way these people are all gone pack up your stuff they have to go through a process um And so they will lay off some chunk of people once the, that process is completed, once the consultation process is complete. Uh, that's our layoff minute for the... I, know, yeah. I was saying we get, get, get some music together for a, you know the weekly layoff segment because it's that regular now. Um, well, hang on. My phone's like buzzing a billion times. Let me make sure that, you know, there weren't like 12 more people that got laid off. Um, no. Okay. Nothing I've seen. Nothing I've seen. Uh, last week we talked about Ninja 5.0 because IGN was promoting that game on a list of games they were going to be showing at uh, an editorial event that they were having. Um, we now know what form that is taking. Uh, last Wednesday, Limited Run Games and Konami have announced that Ninja 5.0 is going to be coming out for the Switch, PS4, and PS5 later this year. That's another one of those ones that's like, why is that not, why does stuff like that not come to Xbox? I, presumably there's a reason, but I don't. Um, Ninja 5.0 is a Game Boy Advance game that is kick-ass and also uh, became somewhat rare and became expensive. So it is an expensive cartridge. It's cool that Limited Run Games is bringing it back around. Ninja 5.0 is a great game that more people should experience. It's a side-scrolling ninja arcade style game in the vein of the original Shinobi arcade game. Um... And it has a kick-ass kind of grappling hook mechanic where you're swinging around. It, it takes some getting used to. It, it's hard to, it's hard at first to attach onto surfaces and swing around up and up, up and around to the top, and all the stuff you do there can be a little tricky. Um, uh, okay, all right. I was my, I was watching my son walk past the window with no accompaniment, and I was like, "What? Wait, is, what is happening here?" Um, okay, there he has. He has supervision. Okay. Um, he's going to walk out the front door into the street. God damn it. Um, Ninja 5.0 is a fantastic uh, GBA game. You should check it out. And then maybe potentially also pick up what Limited Run is putting out. I don't know what... Uh, yeah, they... They haven't given a release date according to, according to Polygon. They have not given a release date and have not said what the like extras that will be included uh, are. It'll have a rewind feature, you know, kind of the standard emulation type stuff. Um, and that will go up for pre-order in March. So we'll know more about what that collection looks like uh, then. Ninja 5.0 is a cool game. You should go watch a little bit of it. If, if nothing else, go, go take a look at Ninja 5.0. Um, all those Xbox games that were coming to other platforms got announced. This was a part of the Nintendo Direct. Uh, there was a Nintendo Partner Direct that happened last week. There was a rumor that it was supposed to, originally supposed to happen the same day as Microsoft's business update podcast and that it ended up getting delayed to account for all of the weird bullshit around that. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but that was the word going around. I don't know the word. There's the, if you, the, the market, the, the social media clout market around attempting, attempting to predict and or leak Nintendo directs is, uh, Truly the dregs, <laughs> truly the absolute dregs of, uh, of the rumor mill. Uh, but let's see here. Uh, Microsoft has issued a press release kind of confirming the specific details about what games are going where. It's not as much as I thought it would be, I guess. Uh, Pentiment is out now on uh, PlayStation 4 and 5 and Nintendo Switch. 
Uh, that caused a fun little stir because I guess the PlayStation 5 version of the game supports 120 hertz, but the Xbox version does not. Um, the Xbox ver the, the, the response to that from the developer was like, that's a bug where there's a patch coming for the Xbox version to enable it. It's, it's a bug. Which like, sure, of course, like shit happens. Um, in this charged environment of weird fanboy bullshit, though, having that happen is fucking like, just another layer of just like, oh, Jesus, guys, you can't catch a fucking break. Like, after you get like, here's one more thing for Xbox nut jobs to complain about. And, and they should have buttoned that up ahead of time, knowing that uh, whatever. Um, also, the idea of Pentiment at 120 hertz is hilarious considering the type of game that Pentiment is. Um, Pentiment is cool. I, uh, I I did not connect with it per se, uh, but it, it's a really neat thing. Uh, it's on Game Pass. You should check it out on Game Pass. It's also, I guess, available on other platforms if you want to pay separate money for it. Sure. Uh, Hi-Fi Rush will come out on March 19th. It is only coming to PlayStation 5. So not Switch basically is is the is the news there. Um which is a shame I guess, you know, it it seems like that that would be kind of a neat game on on the Switch. Um but I wonder if it's just a factor of like, hey, uh Hi-Fi Rush already runs on PC and Xbox and PlayStation 5 is right in that same wheelhouse power-wise. And so it'll run fine, whereas porting it to the Switch is an endeavor that would take a lot more work, I'm guessing. And so maybe that's why you don't do that, because maybe it's just not worth the return on the investment. Or maybe you, the return on the investment is not there, rather, uh, with how long it would take, given how much life the original Switch still has, so on and so forth. Maybe they put it out on, maybe it's a launch game for the next Switch. Who can say? Grounded um, will be coming out on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, and Nintendo Switch on April 16th. Uh, Grounded is a game that I feel like uh, strongly benefits from more people playing it. Uh, it being an online-focused kind of co-op game. like It seems like the people who played quite a bit of Grounded really do like it. Uh, and so, I don't know, the idea of bringing it other places seems like a solid idea. That's, the, you know, that and that is coming to Switch. So we'll see kind of how that version ends up looking. Sea of Thieves. Uh, same deal as Hi-Fi Rush. Sea of Thieves is not coming to Switch. It is just coming to PlayStation 5. And it will come on April 30th. And uh, both Grounded and Sea of Thieves will have cross-play. So, you know, th 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 as far as getting those two games in front of more people to have a larger player base and so on and so forth. Um, I think that's cool. Again, porting Sea of Thieves to the Switch would probably require you to knock down a lot of the cool water physics. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, you, you might have to make so many cuts to Sea of Thieves that you wouldn't even be able to have it do cross-play anymore. I don't know. Uh, and so maybe that's, you know, and, and if it doesn't do cross-play, that's not worth it anymore. Because the whole point is to have all of these player bases feeding into one thing. So um, if you can't sync the water physics across all platforms and so on and so forth, if you can't fake it on the Switch in a way that matches up to the other platforms, well, that, that alone would probably be a disqualifying technological feature of that original game. Um... And so that that's my guess as to why that game doesn't end up coming to to switch in that specific case. Um, and then you know this is the press release they put out, and so the, the follow up there is these titles join franchises like Minecraft, Call of Duty, Overwatch, and Diablo, which already reach players and fans on multiple platforms, and we're excited for more players to experience these worlds and stories on more platforms. I like this, like, it's not, a, it's not a dig per se, but it is this kind of, like, not so subtle reminder, like, hey, these titles join other franchises we own that are already multi-platform games. This isn't something we're new to. Um, 
And then they go on to establish like kind of the bullet points. Uh, basically kind of lay out what their strategy is and, and kind of spell it out for people who need it to be spelled out again. This is what it means to be a part of Xbox. Colon. And then they've got some bullet points here. I, I'm trying to figure out what they mean by a part of Xbox. Do they mean people that are playing games or people that are shipping them? That's that. That's a little less specific. Anyway, here are the here are the core tenets of what it means to be a part of Xbox. The biggest games in the world will be on Xbox. Our first party games will come to Game Pass day one. A robust and innovative multi-year hardware roadmap. Compatibility with your library is a priority, inclusive of cross-play, cross-save, and robust cloud features. Cross-save, by the way, not something they do now in every sense. Um, no, well, I guess they, well, they do sync most of it. So I thought, can, I believe, does campaign progress? I don't know that campaign progress in Halo Infinite crosses over from Steam to the Xbox versions. I'll have to double check that. But like, I know like you don't get achievements in the Steam versions of games because Steam has its own achievements. I would much rather Microsoft tie in its own achievements as well rather than I, I would like to win. I would like to earn achievements in Steam versions of games. I would like to earn my Xbox achievements there. If that's a, a feature that they would love to, you know. Uh, and there's been some additional reporting on this around like, oh, you can sign on in with your Xbox account on some of these consoles and that will help you sync this and that. And 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 so there there is there is going to be some stuff there that will carry from PlayStation to Xbox and, and, and so on. Um, uh, sorry, we have, we've, uh, four compatibility with your library is a priority inclusive cross play, cross save and robust cloud features. And five Xbox will continue to help game creators find the biggest audience possible. There's never been a better time to play and we can't wait for more players to experience these great games. So there you go. Uh, I think that's a, a very sensible move for them considering the games they chose and considering their kind of position in the marketplace when it comes to the Xbox hardware and, and so on. I think it, it makes a lot of sense for them to do that. Um, one of the things they did say during their podcast was that basically that all of these games were over a year old. And so that was maybe a defining feature for games they would consider to bring elsewhere. Um, and we'll see what they do next. I don't know. There's obviously there were multiple games that got rumored alongside of these four games. Um, like Starfield, for example, Indiana Jones was another one that were both directly shot down by Phil Spencer in the, in the podcast. Um, but those games will both be too new. So when those games are over a year old, will it make sense to do that? I don't know. Presumably they will want to make as much money as possible on those games and, and have, uh, presumably if you stretch the timeline out long enough they will have sold as many copies on Xbox as they're going to sell they will have gotten as many game pass hours out of those games as they're likely to get and so maybe in some far flung future they do hit a point where they're like oh actually now now it does make sense for us to put Starfield out on these other platforms and and let's do it um but I don't know. Um, I don't know. It, it was very easy to get caught up in how dire things seemed because, you know, the, the a lot of the talk prior to their podcast, you kind of, you know, you start to kind of wonder, you know, and, and especially in a situation where we don't have access to all of the math, right? You start to, the, the thing I started to do was like, okay, well, I'm going to start pulling apart some some of the sentiment out there around xbox from developers and so on and so forth and li like i said you did start seeing more and more developers that were unhappy with their time on game pass um and you did see that they took away the game pass subscription number as part of the ceo of microsoft's compensation so that was no longer a target for him to hit and so you're like okay 
Well, if that's not a target for him to hit, if he's no longer incentivized to hit that marker, is it because that marker is stalling out and it's not growing as fast as they want? When you look at their earnings reports and you go like, oh, this seems like it's not growing at the rate that it used to. This seems like it's maybe headed here instead of here. Um, and so it, it, you start to pull all of those, th those things together with the reporting or, you know, rumors, I guess. Difficult to call some of that stuff reporting. Uh, around the multi-platform strategy and what it's turning into and also the way it was leaked and how it all kind of exploded at the time had a feel of someone internally is pissed off about this and they're leaking it in order to start in, in order to finish a fight they're like hey i fundamentally disagree with this direction and i'm going to leak this information to get people pissed off so that we don't do this, so that we backtrack, so that we do, you know, and so on and so forth. Or just like, it had that vibe to it. And so things seemed very negative around all of this. You remember, like, uh, it was two weeks ago. But like, all of the stuff around the Xbox stuff seemed so dramatically negative. And at the time, I was like, ah, you know, it'll probably be, like, even, even if it really is all of this stuff that's being rumored, they're not going to announce all of that tomorrow. They're not going to announce all of that next week. It's going to be like, hey, this, this very focused very kind of meek by comparison limping into this multi-platform thing. And I feel like that's pretty much exactly what they did. Um, and it doesn't mean that those games won't eventually come to other platforms. I don't, I don't think that there's, you know, I don't think there's necessarily a downside to that. Um, Thor Double in the chat says, problem is there's no positivity to overshadow the negativity. Yeah, yeah, kind of. I mean, like, it's, this is cool, but it's not like jump out of your chair, exciting, like, oh my God, what amazing game news. Um, I'm sure there are some people on PlayStation that are psyched that they'll be able to play Sea of Thieves. You know, like that's, but again, these games are, these are over a year old. Uh, they're not the most exciting titles in the, in the portfolio. Cause why would they be? And so, yeah, there's, there's not like a, so it, it doesn't, you know, it's not like the weird Xbox fanboys are like, yeah, the Xbox brand is strong. I don't think they came out of this feeling any better about it, about the brand that they've mindlessly attached their personas to, um, and I don't think that there's any, yeah. So it's like, it, it's just, you look at it and go like, this is a cold business move. It makes a ton of sense. Congratulations. This, this, this was not worth any of this, any of the weird fervor around it. None of it needed to be here. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you're right. Like there, there is, there's no real upside to the, to it on the sentiment side. Right. Um, but ultimately I, I don't think that this is something that will linger. I don't think this is something that is going to hurt them in a mainstream way long term. There'll be like, you know, maybe a little blip of people going like, wait, what? Uh, and then the story will get straightened out and that'll be that. It will. It, what I'm saying is it will not be like when the Xbox One did the always online thing. And then... You know, everyone just made grand assumptions about, you know, what that meant. And, and, and even when they backpedaled on it, that the backpedal message did not make the same waves. And so you have people confused. Anyway, I, I don't think it's going to end up being that sort of situation. With, without rehashing even more of the last month of, of Xbox related coverage. I don't think it's going to, I don't think this is uh, that big of a deal. It's a smart thing for them to do. There's been a report, uh, unsubstantiated, that they are potentially getting ready for a discless uh, Xbox Series X in the summertime. I don't know if that's, but you know, the, but they they did also say they would have some hardware around the holiday time frame as a part of that update, and they did talk briefly about how much how powerful the next generation Xbox hardware was going to be that they are working on for down the line. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, I mean, if, if those leaked documents from the court case end up being partially true or whatever, personally, I would like to see um, updated controllers with haptic feedback with the, the more uh, adaptive trigger style of 
of haptic feedback. I think that would be a cool uh, upgrade for them. That would uh, be it would be good to have that across both of the the core platforms, both of the core console platforms, uh, because then more developers would use it. Um, and gyro, sure, why not? Yeah, I I don't have any interest in in gyro in in a, in a controller, but but they should do it. Better rumble, tri better trigger rumble, so on and so forth. And yeah, maybe a, a discless Series X gets them to a cheaper price on the hardware. I don't know. The the Series S has been so affordable um, that I think they would want that price distinction between the two, right? Of just like, no, we can, we can help, you know, in, in some ways they're able to keep the Series X price high because they have a more affordable option for people who need it. And it is genuinely more affordable. Um, and so cutting the price on a Series X long term maybe jeopardizes that ever so slightly, but I don't know. It's probably still not the worst idea in the world. Um, and the digital only stuff, like, I, you know, I don't know. People are going to get angry about that. Um, I don't know. M Microsoft has kind of said time and time again that their future... You know, their strategy doesn't, I think the, the, the line is that their strategy is, does not depend on people going fully digital. That, you know, their strategy does not depend on people like everyone becoming a Game Pass subscriber. And so they like a mix of revenue in there. And so the market is saying they like digital sales. That's not something that Xbox is forcing on people this time. Um, the market has said that they're totally okay with that. And so while I feel for the people who really, really don't want that. There are more of them than there are of you. And this is a direction that I think we will see more of, you know, obviously you can go to get a discless PlayStation five right now. If you, if you so desire as well. So, um, we will see where that ends up. Lastly, I don't, you know, you, you open up the phone in the morning, you kind of just check and see what the fuck's going on. I saw the PlayStation layoffs this morning and I saw one Jeff Keeley posting something online about some kind of strange box that emits smells. And I was like, what the fuck is this? This is a joke, right? This is like a viral campaign for the Summer Games Fest or, or for some, this, this is some kind of, what is this? This is not real. It turns out that someone has finally brought to market some kind of weird box that emits smells. It is called the Game Scent. If you want to experience the smell of the game, uh, it is $150. It is out now. It is. I, so not to start with the end of the story, but I bought one because not, I don't, I think this is a nightmare. I think this is a fucking terrible idea. I think this is a fucking, I think this is bad. But as I was on Discord this morning for the podcast and saw people talking about it and people curious about it, I realized that it, it, it is my, this is my duty. This is my job. This is what I do. If not me, who? So I have ordered one of these. It will be here tomorrow, probably not in time for the Wednesday morning stream. But I will be able to experience smells such as Gunfire, explosions, racing, storm, and forest. They have other scents in the works that are not available yet. Napalm, human exertion, ocean, and freshly cut grass. Also, blood. 
If you go to their website, they have a coming soon thing under a, a little picture of a vial that just says blood. And so as far as I can tell, these are, this is like an essential oil diffuser of some kind that is hooked up to a box and that box is hooked up to an audio source. And so what they're doing, and they're building this as an AI, because of course they are, right? It's like, by the power of AI, we can make your room smell like burning tires. You're like, cool. Thanks, AI. Um, and so the way they are pitching this is that it is not something, there's no developer work to integrate with this device. It is something you plug audio but basically like you you either run hdmi through it or it has a headphone jack on it and you are plugging audio into it and it is listening to the sound of your game and then deciding that sounds like gunfire Pshht. that sounds like an explosion Pshht. very excited to make this room the smell even worse than it already does Um, if it's, it, it's telling that at the bottom of the page on Amazon for this thing, the other, like other people looked at this dumb shit, everything on the list were those shitty fucking haptic vests. So that's the territory we're in. Amazon lists it, makes it look like this thing has been available since November. So I don't know if this is something, the company that made it has been around for a few years working on this hot project and um and so i'll have one tomorrow they sent out a press release i did i uh let's look and see if the press release has any other information that we care about uh as players dive into a game game sense patent pending adapter captures audio in real time these real time audio cues are processed by game sense innovative ai to release scents that correspond with the on-screen action inhale the smoky aroma of battle the exhilarating scent of speeding race cars the calming fragrance of a forest or the fresh smell of rain after a storm um they are not selling replacement cartridges of any kind. There's uh, the, the, on the website, they infer that there will be cartridges and, you know, they show how easy it is to replace them and so on and so forth. But it looks like none of that is actually available yet or for sale at all. It does come with the six smells. I, I don't know. man. So I decided I needed to try this thing. I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. Because believe me, I don't want to do uh, I remember at GDC a zillion years ago seeing basically this, basically this device, except instead of like, it didn't have the audio aspect of it. It was something that developers would have to support. And because no developer is ever like, that's maybe the smartest thing about this is that if it is something that, uh, if it uh, presumably it works, let's assume it works as advertised. It's a big assumption, but, uh, but the idea was that developers would have to integrate like, okay, if you're going to, um, you know, if, if you're going to support this device, you, you say what the smells are and then it triggers or, you know, your engine's going to do this and interface with the device and it will emit the smell and so on and so forth. Um, this is just something that is going to monitor the audio. And so I think that that is smarter because no developer is going to bother supporting it. If you put out an, an SDK for smells, I, uh, uh, skull and bones still has support for the Toby, the eye tracking stuff. Um, and I was just amazed to see that in the menus. They're just like, really? Like we're still like, it had a dedicated screen for it in a way that made it look like, the Toby people were paying Ubisoft for in order to support their device. Um, the Toby thing seems like it's all, it always seemed like it's cool, but it's like, it's very few games look like they integrate it directly. And so it was always this thing of just like, oh, why would I even, why would I even do this? Unless you want to have like a eye tracking indicator on a live stream or something. So it was like, this is on the screen where they're looking you know, whatever it is. Um, 
yeah, it's for flight sims. It's for it's for flight sim lunatics that don't want to wear the hat, right? That don't want to have their head tracking stuff. Um, and so this, by being a device that is listening to the audio and acting accordingly, is smarter because it has the opportunity to just work even if the game's developers have never heard of this fucking thing, which is likely. Um, and uh, thus, it stands a chance of working, you know, much better than, you know, trying to get developers to integrate your smell thing. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. I don't know. This this doesn't... This is the, the, the smell thing has never seemed like a good idea. When I was trying it back at GDC 15 years ago or something like that, even that was just like, you know, some Kensha Hall ass shit. Some real off to the side ass shit of just like, we're here taking meetings and these people will be at GDC taking meetings as well. Uh, as well as PAX. It looks like they will be at PAX. Um, but it's also just out. So you can just buy one. I don't know. And so I did. I, I, I again, not proud to say, I, I felt like I had to. There were enough people talking about it with interest that I was like, you know what? I, I need to solve. I need, this is, this is my job. And, uh, yes. Okay. Sorry. The, the real, the real names for the smells that they are going to issue later as add-ons blood ocean sports arena and fresh cut grass. So we'll find out more about that this week. Like I said, it probably won't show up in time for the Wednesday morning stream, but, uh, Maybe we'll see what Dino Wars destruction of Spondulus smells like. I, I don't know. I don't know. <sighs> Why don't we get into some emails? Podcast at guard.bike is the email address. I guess, I, I guess everything I, this is something else that I guess in retrospect I did for you because I do have an answer to this question that just came in from Kyle in Canada who asks, will you be reviewing the Chitza? The internet needs to know your thought on the Chitza. I had the Chitza last night. If you're not familiar with what this is, Kentucky Fried Chicken is selling a piece of food. <laughs> they have taken a piece of chicken. They have put some marinara sauce on top of it. They have put some mozzarella cheese on top of it, and they have put about two pieces of pepperoni on top of it. That's the chitza. It's chicken pizza. A small order is one piece. A regular order is two pieces. I ordered a regular order, but they only gave me one, which is probably, in retrospect, better for, me, better for everyone involved that I received half of what I ordered. It's fine. It's not, it's, it's like, it, it, they just, it's like they rebranded the chicken parm. They're like, hey, do you want a chicken parm that you can eat with your hands? I'm like, no, I fucking don't. I love a nice chicken parm. How do you spell it? It's C-H-I-Z-Z-A, chicken pizza. So thanks to Kyle from Canada for writing in and asking about that at the precise, correct time. God damn it. I don't know what that says about me. But uh, I had to know. And now we all know. Uh, Alex from Wisconsin writes in. 
curious of your thoughts on the PSP Go. The idea uh, for an all-digital console didn't pan out, but would it have succeeded in a more robust digital gaming world like today? Could something like it do well now, or was it all just a big pile of poo doomed to live amongst the graveyard of flop consoles? Wow. That's... Wow. Wow. Uh, the PSP Go was awesome. It was awesome at the time. It was a convenient little device, but also the PSP was kind of not quite on its way out, but sort of on its way out by the time the PSP Go uh, came out. It it did video out, which was handy, as, as a lot of the later model PSPs did. Uh, the PSP was an awesome device. Um... Especially once you could get all the games for free. No, um, the, the PSP Go was cool. I was happy to buy a PSP Go and store games directly on it and have a digital only PSP Go. The PSP was a, was a cool, man, I, that is probably one of my favorite trips to Japan was when we went over for the PSP launch and got PSPs and, um, and then had to figure out how to rig up getting footage of PSP games. And so Ryan McDonald is sitting on a bed in a Japanese hotel room with a bunch of cardboard. And he's like trying to wrap it and tape it in such a way and trying to get this cardboard in just the right, because he's trying to, he wants to fit it onto the camera lens over the hood of the camera and then like duct tape a PSP to the other end of it. So it's a dark, uh, a dark environment with a set focus so we can just focus the camera once and he literally got PSP footage he was looking through the camera at the and and he was playing on the on the other end of the camera so he has to hold his hands out here at the, at the far end of the camera and stay as still as he can because it's still a little jostly and he's taking all this footage of like fucking dark stalkers running on a PSP um the PSP is awesome, and, and I the UMDs are a cool format for games. The PSP felt fucking solid. That original PSP felt like a cool fucking brick that played video games. The later models had, were a little more plasticky and a little more hollow, but like that first issue PSP, like that, it just, this kick-ass fucking, dev like, it's such a good a good device and eventually you know the analog stick would break and come off and you'd be like shit and, and you know some devices the circle buttons stopped working in that first run and so that was frustrating um Lumines is still one of the best launch games of all time um I love the PSP uh the PSP Go by the time it came out uh I was still into it uh, but also a lot of them had been hacked at that point and hacking the PSP go was not a difficult thing either. And so suddenly you're like, well, this thing actually will play any PlayStation one game. If you do it just right, that's pretty neat. Uh, and, um, yeah, I don't know, man, I, the PSP go didn't necessarily fail because it was digital only. I think it just, it, and I don't know, I don't even know that I'll call it a failure. I, I don't, I don't know one way or the other, uh, off the top of my head. The thing I would say about the PSP Go was that by the time it came out, the sun had already started setting on the PSP as a concept. Whether that was because of the piracy problem or what have you, <clears throat> the PSP was already, you know, Sony kind of does this thing, right? And, and they were better about it then. But Sony is really good at launching a device, a secondary device, like say a virtual reality headset. And then not really ever supporting it with the full weight of their development studios, which is sensible when you think about the reduced, you know, if you're going to have Naughty Dog make a full video game, you want to put it on the highest install base device you've got. And so instead you take the Naughty Dog property and you give it to some other studio and say, make a fucking Vita version of this, you know? And so on the PSP, that was twisted metal or you know like some like the god of war games and which were very well received for what they were but it wasn't the same studio right and and so sony's always been really good at just doing that and their own games were never really the draw there 
But you got a lot of good third-party games on the PSP. A ton of great third-party games on the PSP. Um, the Vita, not so much. I mean, the Vita, the Vita is like a more extreme case of that all around. But um, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I really loved the PSP. I thought it was, a, it was a cool fucking device. I encoded a lot of videos into 3GP format. Uh, so I could watch some movies on it. Uh, I, enco I, I will, I, I encoded pornography to put on a PSP. I had a memory stick. I bought the biggest memory stick they would sell. And so I could put all types of films on them, adult or otherwise. And I was like, look at this, look at this. There's people doing it on this PSP. That's silly. And I was like, all right, that's a, fu okay. I don't, I don't, I don't need that. So I can erase, I can make space for more stuff now and erase it. Uh, but I, but I definitely did it. I definitely encoded porn, uh, for you, for, for, for being on a PSP. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the PSP was just a cool device. The later ones uh, th that started doing video out were cool, but just again, the feel of that first one, how solid it felt in the hand, uh, I think goes a long way. Kick-ass device. The PSP Go was cool too. The PSP Go felt a little weird in the hand, right? I mean, and remember, the PSP Go was not that far off from, I think it was around the same time. Yeah, I learned how to use Handbrake because I had to encode videos for a PSP. I learned a lot about video encoding specifically because, of, because I had to encode videos for the PSP. A lot of stuff I still use on a, like a, a lot of knowledge I use on a, on a very regular basis now uh, that I didn't use as part of a team that had people that handled video. Like now, like all of that stuff is coming back around and it's like, no, okay, it's good that I know how to trim a fucking MP4. It's good that I know how to do this. It's good that, I, you know, and a lot of that is stuff that I initially learned uh, fucking ripping videos for the PSP. <laughs> um. It was a cool device. Uh, let's see. So yes, yeah, Tom from Jersey writes in. This is, we talked about this earlier. Just wanted to get your take on the surge of remasters and remakes we've seen. My theory is that these remaster projects have become essential for keeping brands relevant and maintaining income while the new games take longer than ever to make. Also, Sony seems to be remastering and even remaking a few PS4 games these days. What are the chances that more PS3 games could get a similar treatment. Yeah, uh, yes. So, um, in terms of keeping brands relevant as, as games take longer to make, I think that that's, that is certainly a viewpoint. I think that that's probably a consideration or a potential consideration in some cases, but I do think it's a, it's also a matter of like, these games are very expensive. And so reissuing them, you get to do a, less expensive overall project when you're remastering these games and you get to put it back out and ideally make a good amount of money on it. And so I think just from a, a cost benefit analysis sort of perspective, I think that those remasters probably make a lot of sense. The thing to remember, you know, these remasters aren't all for you, right? Um, as gaming has grown, as more and more people have kind of gotten uh, gotten under the tent and gotten into video games, um, there are people who didn't play those games. There are people who, I mean, the PlayStation Three came out in what two thousand six. That's 18 years ago. Eight, that's eight, 18 years ago. So when you say, oh, I can't believe they're remaking PS3 games. PS3 games are fucking old, dude. There are a lot of people playing games now who were not playing games then. So... You know, 
I, I think from from that perspective as well, I think if there are, are good games sitting back there uh, that are just kind of languishing and wasting away that you can find ways to bring back and find ways to make them do well. I, I can't see any reason not to. These, these projects are not getting in the way of like the big new expensive ones. Like they can do both. Um, and so, I don't know. I, I, I look at it as like, I don't, like, I don't care about a Last of Us remake. I just, I, 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 I'm never going to. Like, if they went and they remade all the God of War games, all the PS2 era God of War games, that is not something I am especially interested in. Um, but there are a ton of people who have never played those games. And they were very well received. And if you remade them and you touched up the things that maybe have uh, become a little less acceptable in game controls and so on and so forth these days, if you if you added some good accessibility features and whatever else you needed to make those games feel at least a little bit more modern, um, they should do it. Again, it, it's it's just one of those, like, it's a chart and a graph. It's a math problem. How much will it cost us to remaster this game? Um, how much money do we think we can make on a project such as this? Okay, great. That, that game pays for itself. Go tell this studio that specializes in this sort of work to do that for us. You know, they just announced that Battlefront uh, package that Aspire is doing. That's cool. People, there are people who fucking love those original Battlefront games. And so the idea of those coming back, that's neat. Will they do it right? Nah. That's the that's the question, right? Um So I I don't really harbor any particular like ill will. Like there are people that get really mad about the announcement of remasters and and like oh they're double dipping, they're triple dipping, like all this stuff. Don't fucking buy it. If you've played the game already and you still have the game, don't buy it. No one is forcing you. Like, I can't believe they're selling this game a third time. What am I to do? I've got to buy. Like, just don't. Just don't. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be for you. It's not for you. If you're happy with what you played and you don't feel any need to revisit it, I'm sure they would love for you to buy it again. And that's why they'll include a new mode here and there to try to hook people and, and do this sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, don't fucking do it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's, uh, there's no like immediate downside to those remasters. You could, or you could argue that like, oh, that money would go into the kind of B game, smaller project type stuff that doesn't exist anymore. And my answer to you is no, it wouldn't, they would have, they would have been doing that. If they were going to do that, they would be, they would still be doing that too. If that was something that would make them money to have those games on their slate. Um, so I, you know, I think it makes sense, especially as games get more and more expensive. I think you, you will expect to see more and more things like this, whether it's, you know, they're going to find ways to get more time out of their games, whether that's like, Hey, we're going to make a live service game and hopefully we'll, you know, be able to monetize for five years and sell you hot skins or whatever. But like not, most games are not going to, most of the games that get remastered, uh, especially, are not going to necessarily benefit from that because I feel like when, and it'll be interesting to see with this Battlefront game, this re, this re-release. I feel like when you remaster and re-release a game that is primarily known for its multiplayer, you're like, that doesn't work for long. That's like a, I had a really fun launch month with that and then everyone went to go play something else and then I never got to play it again, you know? Um, so I think that that's, that's, sort of, that's sort of hard. So like I assume that when this Battlefront remaster comes out, people will play it for a month or two at like good quantities of players and then they'll probably be like, oh, this other game came out and all, and they'll put it down and the servers will dwindle and, you know, it'll just get harder and harder to find a game again. I'm guessing, you know, maybe Battlefront has the juice to, to make it 
long term or something. But um, but there are plenty of brand new games that come out and can't sustain multiplayer servers for more than a few months. Anyone checked in on Foam Stars lately? I know there's. I feel like there's also. So I, I saw something saying Foam Stars Season 2 is starting. To which I say, that game just came out, what, like two weeks ago and you're starting your second season? That seems like some kind of crime. <laughs> um, I feel like if you are doing a seasonal model, and it, well, I don't know. I feel like seasons should, generally speaking, be quarterly. Street Fighter VI is done. It's, I I got like the first two Street Fighter VI battle passes, and then realized like, yo, these things fucking feel like they come out one a week or something. Like, what the hell is going on? And so I stopped even paying attention to what the the Street Fighter VI premium battle fight pad, whatever the fuck it was. I was just like, ah, right, whatever. I'm not even gonna look at these things anymore. Um. Because there were too many of them too soon. Call of Duty. Say what you will. And I, you know, I think Fortnite, I, I pay less attention to Fortnite, but I, my assumption from the little bits and pieces I do check in on it, uh, seems like they're kind of doing it in a similar way. You kind of need some months between seasons. You need some time. Uh, I feel like seasons should be quarterly, generally speaking. And, you know, Call of Duty does it smart to a certain degree because they um, they will do a mid-season update. And so I, I don't necessarily mean that there should only be one content drop per quarter. But I think if you're going to issue a new battle pass and do all of that sort of stuff, I think, you know, every 90 days or something like that seems roughly okay. Roughly about right. Um, because the game needs maps more frequently than every 90 days. And so that's that's the thing that, that Call of Duty gets right about it. Is they they put out their season and it's all this new shit. And you're like, oh, there's a bunch of new guns in here. And some of the guns are on the battle pass and some of the guns are not. And then they have a new motif that they... All the new skins are... Like this one, it's like, all the new skins are zombies. And I'm like, that's stupid. Um, thanks for those. I'm not going to buy any of them. Uh... But then you've got like, okay, here's three new maps that are launching, and then midway through the season, we're putting out two more. And you're like, great, okay, that's the thing I actually care about. What are the things we're doing for the gaming part of the gaming? Um, and if uh, dummies buying zombie skins is what funds the ability to put out maps and no longer have to sell map DLC and split a user base, making the map DLC worthless... I think that's a better solution than what we used to have back in the late 2000s when they were selling maps uh, and fucking everything up. Selling maps fucked up a lot of stuff. Again, maybe you, maybe you don't remember that because it was the late 2000s, so much like the PlayStation 3, it was a zillion years ago. But when they sold maps, you had friends who bought the maps and you had friends who did not bought the maps. And the friends who did not bought the maps, you didn't play with them anymore because you bought the maps. And so suddenly you were like, oh, we can't even be in a party anymore because, oh, because I, oh, because you didn't buy the maps. Why didn't you buy the maps? You have to buy the maps. Are we going to keep playing this game? You should buy the maps. And you're like, oh, I didn't buy the maps. Oh, okay. Well, fuck off forever then. Because we're over here. We bought the maps. And so it was like, that was a way worse situation. If the maps is free and then it's like, did you buy Nicki Minaj or not? It's a better solution. Uh, Mason writes in with a really important question. And I, uh, Mason in Virginia writes in and says, is Put Em On The Glass a better song than Baby Got Back? Now I turned to a Sir Mix-a-Lot expert for this. 
Uh, I do have my thoughts on it as well. But I asked uh, Marco, a Sir Mixlot expert, uh, this very question and received this response. This is a very complex question. Overall, I'd probably say no. The music video for as good as it is can't stand with Baby Got Back. The lyrics of Baby Got Back are better simply because it actually keeps the plot of being about asses. Put Em on the Glass is a song about cars disguised as something else. The only thing Put Em on the Glass has a clear advantage in is the production. Yeah. Um, Put Em on the Glass is a funny song, but I think if, if we're looking at this, so this is, this is now my, you know, I, I, I might call myself something of a Sir Mix-a-Lot aficionado. If not an expert, I, I don't, I don't keep up on Sir Mix-a-Lot's rare music. I think it's the same way that some others might. Um, I, uh, I think that Sir mix catalog starts extremely strong. Swass, out of the gate, banger, all time, great record. Seminar, after that, not as good as Swass, but it does have beepers on it. And beepers is a great track. After that, we get Mac Daddy, and that's where Baby Got Back comes into the picture. Mac Daddy is not a bad album, but it's it's getting more and more uneven. I was not a big Baby Got Back fan when it blew up because it was just a little too much, and it was something that was just like, I don't know, man. Posse's on Broadway is a great... Gold is a great... Rippin' is a great Sir Mix-a-Lot track. Like, there were just... They, like, it just... It pigeonholed a very versatile and uh, skilled artist such as Sir Mix-a-Lot into becoming the ass man of his generation. And hey, we can all aspire to be the ass man for our generation. Sir Mix-a-Lot, Billy Gunn. Uh, we would all do better to be a little bit more like both of them. Um, and it, he, Sir Mixlot has done very well for himself, riding, uh, riding that ass all the way to the bank. But I think his output post Baby Got Back has been, or post Mac Daddy, the album, uh, has, has taken, it, it takes a serious qualitative dive after that. We see some stuff here, you know, Swap Meet Louie is on, on, I believe that's on Mac Daddy. Great track, great track. Um, but once we get past that, it just, it's, it's not the same. I think that he's, uh, Sir makes a lot kind of loses his way there. And some of the, you know, re return of the bumpasaurus. By the time we get to that point, you're like, why are we? No, no, man. Where is kid sensation? Where is Larry? The real estate investor. Where is Larry now? The oral history of Larry. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, like by the time we get to put him on the glass, put him on the glass seems like a weird joke. Not that baby got back doesn't, but put him on the glass feels like it's not even like a sad attempt at trying to recapture the baby got back thing. It is more just like, a, oh, this is like, okay, you're like having fun. You're okay. You're having fun. All right. Um, and so the only thing I would say about put him on the glass is that it does have the one part where Sir Mixlot says lungs, lungs, motherfucking lungs. And that's funny to me. He's talking about boobs, people. He wants you to put them on the glass. Tom from Brooklyn writes in. I will not, this Testarossa is a terrible track. Someone in here is saying that Testarossa is better than Baby Got Back. And actually, now that I'm saying that out loud, maybe you're not entirely wrong. Because Baby Got Back ultimately is not a great song. Like, it's, it's a hit for a reason. The music video, like, like everything, everything converged in such a way that is, like, amazing for Sir Mix-a-Lot. Like, all the, but it is not his best work. It's not even, it's not his, it's not great work. Baby Got Back is not a great song. It never was. As someone who once covered Baby Got Back as part of a band, 
and had to perform it multiple times. I will tell you, a crowd appreciates it. But it's not a great song. Is it important? Absolutely. But it's not, Baby Got Back's not an amazing song. He, he's done so much better. I would, oh, I could listen to Square Dance rap right now. God damn it, man. Put on buttermilk biscuits? Jesus Christ. Hip hop soldier? Shit is hard. All right. Tom from Brooklyn writes in and says A rogue thought I had is what happens to gaming if the AI bubble bursts due to wild overpromising and a wildly overpriced NVIDIA collapses due to said bubble bursting? Do you think we get extra long generations than what we already have? Does Intel finally take over the space? Or does it just become an AMD dominated space pushing up prices due to lack of competition? It's a good question. So NVIDIA, I mean, you know, NVIDIA is huge. NVIDIA is like a trillion dollar company now. They became bigger than Amazon from a stock price market cap, whatever perspective. Like they, they are scary. NVIDIA is frightening with how large they are. There's a, a interview in Wired with this, the, the head of NVIDIA that I was reading the other day and it was him talking about like his vision for how, you know, like how he thinks AI is going to do this and that. So like, yes, Nvidia's stock price is, I'm not going to say propped up by, but Nvidia is less and less of a GPU company and more and more of just a, a PU company. If that's going to be an NPU an AI PU, whatever letters they end up slapping on the front of it. Um, and so, yes, what happens if that bubble bursts and demand for their processors takes another dive, much like it did when the crypto shit happened, uh, but to a much larger degree? Um, yeah, that, that would probably be very devastating for NVIDIA. I also, I think that they could still fall back onto their graphics business and and still survive. I don't think that NVIDIA necessarily would be destroyed by an AI bubble bursting. Um, it would be devastating to large parts of their business, but I think they would be able to cut and figure out what the, what the right answer is there. You know, like the technologies that they've uh, become known for on the gaming side, stuff like DLSS and some of the like, various, uh, you know, kind of AI adjacent processing is still going to be relevant. Um, but yeah, I don't know. At the end of the day, like, yeah, what is the consumer GPU market and like, who cares? How many people will care? How long will they care for? Um, currently, AMD is making most of the consoles. Uh, NVIDIA is doing the parts for Nintendo and presumably they're doing them for the next Nintendo device. But at the end of the day, like the, the part of part of Jensen's view for the future is that they're going to be building buildings devoted to AI and be like, if you're building a car factory, you will also have a building next to it that is full of fucking our processors because you're going to need that processing power in order to do this and do that, you know, around the, around the way that, that cars will be made in the future. And and someone wrote in, you know, we, we do, we do shit on AI around here. Um, someone wrote and said like, Hey, you know, there's also like the, the way that AI stuff gets applied in the medical field and in health, like they are finding new cures to diseases. They are, they are researching that there's a highly potential that when new genes are discovered and so on, it is because of AI related work. And, and you know, so like that end of it of like, hey, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to machine cars? What are we going to do for this? And how does it become part of the construction process? Not necessarily in a way that replaces humans, but more in a way of like, you know, we're going to let a computer, instead of us thinking or sitting around and thinking about genetics all day long, we're going to let a computer stare at it as fast as it possibly can and see if it can come up with this or that. Like, I bet if you took an AI and built it just so, and said, 
hey, um, these are the hallucinogenics that we know about today. Here's LSD, here's DMT, here's the, you know, like here's, and, and here's some, um, similar compounds. Here's two CT seven. Here's, you know, all these different, all this different weird shit. Um, can you stare at all of the drugs in the history of drugs and the way that the human anatomy works with them and what receptors they bond to and blah, blah, blah. Can you stare at this? and invent me nine new drug compounds that are technically legal because they're not, um, they're not quite the same as, uh, some of this other stuff. Like, yeah, I, I bet that, I bet that that's something that it could definitely do. Designer drugs from AI. Of course the law has, you know, they've, what are they, uh, I forget what the law is that they, when they, they changed the law so that a lot of these kind of technically similar, like we changed one molecule and so it's not LSD, but it does all the same stuff and it's legal and we're selling it to the gas station. Um, th something, the DEA changed some law here that, that makes it so like if you sell something that is basically LSD, but not technically LSD, it is still illegal. Of course, that's not, no one is selling over the counter LSD fucking synthetics or whatever but you know what i mean um and so i don't know in that whole weird realm like yeah i'm sure having you know having computer eyes stare at these problems in ways that humans uh can't and then having humans vet that research and going actually that these three things look like they might really work we should check that out yeah i'm i'm sure that there's something to all of that sort of stuff. Um, and so like, I don't think that the, the demand for NVIDIA hardware, unless some other company comes along and does it, there was another, there's another company in the market that claims that they're, oh, this is the company that's going to eat NVIDIA's lunch and blah, blah, blah. But who, that's whenever anyone positions a company that way, it sounds like a fucking stock scam more than anything else. Like the Reddit IPO, but somehow scarier. Fucking Reddit IPO. Give me a fucking break. Hey, do you want to buy stock in the worst idea in the world? In 2024? Do you want to, hey, do you want to buy stock in a website? Are you fucking kidding me? Jesus. Do you want to buy uh, some stock in one of the websites uh, most devoted to uh, fucking people hating each other being scary weird bigots and reddit going like no this this bigotry is okay we've banned the bad bigotry you want to invest in that don't read don't read the ipo where it says how bad of an idea this really is don't read the subreddits where people are talking about how bad of an idea it is and how they intend to make reddit fail <laughs> oh anyway what a terrible fucking idea. The world is so fucked. Mm. The future is crazy, man. Computer LSD. And Reddit IPOs. All of the worst ideas in the world coming together. Uh, yeah, so I, anyway, I, I don't think that... I, I think that even if demand for NVIDIA's hardware doesn't maintain this level i i don't necessarily believe that they will completely implode if that market does dry up um but also i i do think that like they will have trouble over the years in in the in the years forward um maintaining interest in their existing businesses you know the kind of the the consumer gpu market like how much longer is that going to be a big deal i mean we'll have to see what the next set of consoles do and you know like obviously they've got a you know a 50 series card in the works and and how much will that matter i i guess i what i'm saying is over these last couple of generations of nvidia cards it feels like people are just getting like the, the average person is just getting more and more fed up with it. And you go look at the steam hardware survey. People are not finding great reasons to upgrade to the latest generation or two of NVIDIA hardware. Like there aren't always a lot of great reasons to go like, I've got to get a 4090. I'm happy with my 4090. 
as a 4090 owner, uh, when I look at how much it cost, uh, and when I bought it, it was at cost as much as it was going to cost. And then some, um, it's crazy. It's crazy. The amount of money they still want to charge for, for some of that stuff. And so, you know, but, but AMD doesn't feel like they're making any major headway. And, and again, I'm not looking at sales information for this, but like, you know, it doesn't feel like AMD is like taking over by virtue of them having affordable GPUs comparatively. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know what the, what's going to drive people to upgrade. What will drive people to buy a new graphics card? It's not ray tracing or, or rather it, it, it's not ray tracing for enough people. Again, you go and look at the steam hardware survey and you look at resolutions out of that and, and try to infer like what the general gaming audience is probably doing. You have a lot of people running at 1080 and being totally happy with that. I mean, I run at 1440 and I love it. 4k is a farce. So the idea of like Nvidia coming back around with like a 5090 and being like, now look at this graphics power. Like, no, like, and that's why you see NVIDIA getting into all of this other shit, right? It's part of it because it's a much more lucrative thing for them right now because it is much more buzzy. But also you see them keep stacking weird functionality onto the GPU and NVIDIA. Like they just, they just issued this, like it's a chat bot that runs on your GPU and so you tell it what it knows, like it, you, you install it. And then there's like a directory and you can just put a bunch of documents in that directory, you know, PDFs or, or whatever, or you can feed it a document and it will know it, it will learn it. It will integrate it the same way fucking Microsoft Copilot, you know, or whatever. And so you can have your own little, um, your own little chat bot that only knows what you told it to know. And you can feed it YouTube videos and weird shit like that. It's, it's a, it's a trip. It's just like a weird thing. You're just like, I, okay. And, and they're not selling. They're not, you know, it's just a thing you can just go download. If you have a recent enough graphics card and you can run it. Um, and I, I installed it and I, I talked to it about a little bit of things. And then I fed it some documents and asked it a couple of questions about the documents. And it was like, here's what it says here. I'm like, yeah, okay. I could have read it myself. I think that's maybe the big thing about all of this. The big thing about chatbot based computing, uh, which is what everyone seems to think that we want, you know, Microsoft with Copilot and all of these different chatbots that are on websites now and just like, why don't you, if, instead of talking to a human for customer service, why don't you talk to this chatbot that suddenly got like, way more conversational, but also slightly worse at solving your fucking problems because chatbots before were not maybe as fluent in English or conversational as they are now, but they were a lot better at letting you know what they could and could not do. Whereas modern chatbots try to just be like, I'm just a person. And then you find the edges in a very uncanny valley kind of way. And so chatbot style computing, or, or rather when it, when it is exposed as just like, here's a chatbot as a, I mean, everything is kind of like a, everything is a, is a query, right? Everything is kind of a chatbot. All of this AI shit is just kind of a chatbot. Find us drugs. Okay. Um, I don't like to, and, and at some point this becomes an interface fight probably. I like to use computers. Um, I don't like to type emails on my phone. I like to come in here and sit down and type it because it's just, it's, it's faster. It's more efficient for me than it is tapping it out on my phone. And then I feel like I have to read it more times to make sure it's not full of typos when I do it on my phone, where when I sit down at the computer, I knock it out and it's done. Um, and so I, and, and, and I go all the way, right? Different people are going to have different versions of that when it comes to their comfort level. I like being able to pop open a terminal window. I, I like to navigate DOS sometimes. I like to pop up a, a fucking bash shell here and there when I need one. And I'm not even necessarily good at that. There are people that go way deeper on that than I ever will ever be capable of. But there are also people and probably way more people 
who don't know that and never want to do that. That was something that was like a customer service. I forget what, but basically it was on, I think it was on our, our discord, but basically it was like a customer service person saying like, it's really hard to help people now because no one knew, knows how to use a fucking computer. No one knows what files or folders are. No one knows like how the, uh, com like data on a computer is structured. Like, oh, this physical device is my C drive and on this drive is this and that's why it's there and here's how to get to it and here's how to edit it and do this. Whereas people just, you know, whether it's an iPad or whatever else, all that stuff is obfuscated to a degree where there's, they never like, what? I need to look at my D drive. Like no one fucking, there's just more and more people that don't necessarily know how that shit works anymore. And, um, and that's because the interfaces have gotten better to the point where they don't need to know that stuff. Um, and so like, you know, I, to me, the weird thing is like the iPhone has a files app and you can access folders and something of a file system, not the root, you know, you can't, you know, Unless you're going to go fucking jailbreak it and type in Alpine and do all this other shit. You're not going to, you know, get to the real file system of your iPhone. But the idea of here are some files and you can save them here and upload them somewhere else later. Like iOS's solution to that was to literally add an app called Files. And before that, I don't know that there was a way for you to just download and possess files on a phone that weren't of a format that worked with some other app that you already had installed. And so, yeah, tech literacy is in a really weird place where people integrate are, are more integrated with more technology than they ever have been before, before, but they don't know how any of it really works. And I think that's generally fine as long as you have enough people who do still know how it works, because there's always going to be someone who has to program the VCR for your parents, right? Um, and the chat bot thing, the chat GPT thing is something I so don't want out of a computer because I don't need that. I don't need to ask a computer like, Hey, can you check my email? Can you do that? I can fucking check my email. Hey, can you summarize this? Like, no, I can, I know how to fucking read. If it was a 200 page document, maybe, but like I can, I can do that. I already know how to do that. And Asking, like adding a layer of some fucking dumb chat bot in the middle that's going to go, well, I think it says this. And then me going like, I don't know if I believe you. And now I need to read it anyway to make sure it's not wrong. Um, so I think we, we, we're on the verge of another like, and some of it will be generational, but some of it will just be like interface preference. Um, there's an episode of Mystery Science Theater where Crow T. Robot and Tom Servo are arguing about PC versus Mac. And it's Tom Servo sitting at a, at a big old fucking CRT trying to load WordPerfect 5.1 from the conversation you're having. And he's, he's typing forward slashes instead of backslashes. And then he starts going, well, my, if my Mac was doing this, and then Crow just launches into... Be like, oh, well, oh, do you want a clown that comes over and dances and winks at you and points at the filing cabinet? And there you go. Like, we're on that again. What do you want your interface to be? Do you want the happy clown that's going to point to you and wink and say like, hey, buddy, do you want Microsoft Bob for a new generation? You know? Do you want the friendly OS that's going to be the lady in your computer that tells you where when your flight is? Maybe you do. Maybe a lot of people will. A lot of people will. And so I think that's all of these companies that are banking on that and banking on all of that shit are banking on people just not wanting to get into the muck of using a computer anymore and just wanting to be able to say this sort of stuff. And that's what Siri was originally kind of um, positioned as. It's like, oh, well, Siri and, and all these voice assistants and Cortana on Windows and all of that shit. I was like, oh, Cortana, when's my flight? Like all of this stupid stuff. Um, but it was always oriented towards people that had flights and had emails and meetings and all of this other stuff. But what about everybody else that's just like, how do I get to the soccer? You know, where's the soccer field? I need to take my kid to this. Where? How do I get there? And so doing that, you know, Apple Maps is pretty decent these days. 
but not as good as it should be. Siri sucks. Phone digital assistance sucks. And now Siri's lighting up to hear all of this. Sorry. Um, but a lot of those, those sorts of voice assistants suck because you have to know specifically how to talk to them. And so the chat GPT thing, the promise of it is like, it will just handle more ways of you talking to it and it will be able to answer more questions because it is allowed to look at the internet and, and interpret it. Whereas something like Apple's stuff is like, when you ask it a question about a thing that's on a website, it goes, yeah, here's the website. And you're like, no, I don't want to open the fucking web browser. Like answer the question. Um... But at the end of the day, like, I, you know, like that stuff, that's the stuff that feels like it has a very long way to go because the stuff in our phones right now is not far enough along. And I would argue that the chat GPT stuff is still so shaky and so fucking weird um, that it's not trustworthy either. Now, people say are, are always quick to say like, oh, that's going to improve and it's going to change your life and all this other stuff. And like, no, I mean, like, okay, maybe. But I don't, I don't really need a voice assistant. I just don't. For the sort of stuff I'm doing, like, am I going to be, oh, I'm going to be so much more vital when I can do this or do this. It's like, that's already, already stuff you can already do. In a lot of cases with existing voice assistants, you just have to know how to talk to it as opposed to using slightly more natural language. And, um. And so that's why like a lot of the, the current like chat bot stuff that people keep promoting and people keep trying to force out there just seems pointless because it's just, because it's, it's like them trying to figure out a, a, a new interface for working with computers and working with the internet. And again, there will be some people that, uh, that will maybe benefit them because they're not computer savvy enough to use it any other way. Um... But I, I just, I can already do that stuff. And it's not, it, it's rarely difficult stuff. I'm not asking it to synthesize new forms of LSD. Uh, that I couldn't do myself. But uh, asking it to be like, when's my flight? Can you, can you let this person know that I'm going to be 20 minutes late to our lunch date? Like, that's all shit you can do now. Like, what are the actual needs of a person in these scenarios that, like, we have to fucking, like, do all of this fucking shit? It's, uh, fucking bizarre. And then, you know, yeah, when you get into the media manipulation end of it, that's a, that's a different thing then, you know? Like, is there something useful about that? Like, sure. Uh, someone mentioned, yeah, AI is replacing music mastering jobs. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, whether it's ozone and, and all that sort of stuff, like, like those sorts of tools have just been getting better and better to the point where you can maybe trust it. Um, when I was making music, it was always horribly mastered, terribly mastered, but also I was making it in such a hobbyist way that I was, it was unlikely that I would ever pay a person to master it for real. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I like in some cases you could make the argument that FL studio and the, you know, the, the rise of the DAW put people out of work because when we recorded albums in the mid nineties, we went to a studio and we paid a guy an hourly rate to record all of this stuff and lay down the guitar tracks and lay down like, you know, because, because we could get a four track and we could record some stuff in a garage, but it, oh, the microphones are too expensive. This is too much of this. This is, you know, like the idea, like you're basically just setting up your own studio at that point. Now, the idea of like, like going into a studio to record, you know, like if you're recording drums, 
there are there are ways to do it of course you have to spend the money but like you know if you're going to record drums and you're going to record all that stuff like there's probably still value in going into a real studio but um recording vocals i would never i would never go to a studio again like if i was making music i would never go to a studio again to to record vocals because that gear is very attainable um You know, putting out CDs used to require, and still does, but, you know, put, putting out a CD and getting a barcode on it and getting into store, like, like that's all stuff. Now it's just like, oh, I don't know. Just upload these flax to this service and put it on this, you know, like technology is always going to disrupt the status quo to some degree. Now, do I think that we owe it to ourselves to figure out ways to do that responsibly, especially in ways that are grand sweeping changes. Sure. Of course. Um, but like when cool edit pro came out and had multi-track recording in it, which cool edit pro eventually became Adobe audition after Adobe bought it. Cool edit pro changed things dramatically to the point where there was a lot of stuff that we didn't need to do in the studio anymore especially if you're just doing rap tracks and there's no live instrumentation on it, it would be dumb to go to a studio at that point. And I said, I would say that in 1996, 1997, that like the guy we paid an hourly rate to use his, to use his garage, to use his back room that he had turned into a studio um, you know, he was not the best mastering artist in the world. He was, he was, he was the frustrating thing about mastering records with a band is that you have to stay there and sit there with the guy to make sure that no one else in the band comes in and fucks it up because eventually your guitar player is going to show up to one of the sessions and he's going to say, could you turn the guitar up a little bit? And if you're not there to say, don't, Mm. Mm. that guy will go sure and then suddenly you've got fucking mastered mixes where the guitar is overpowering the vocals and you're like what the fuck what are these assholes doing why am I in this band with these dipshits so now I can just do it all by myself <laughs> um anyway <laughs> That's a lengthy aside, but I guess what my point is that, you know, there was a time when page maker, you know, when desktop publishing, the desktop publishing revolution, you know, was, uh, disrupting the zine scene and, and all this other stuff. Right. So I just, everything is always going to fuck with something. Um, and you just, I think the, the, the onus is on people to try to make sure that that happens in a responsible way. Um, and so the idea that like, yes, these tools are going to get in, you know, like just divorce it from the AI buzzword because like this stuff was going to head in that direction either way. The idea that like modern versions of isotope ozone are really fucking good at mastering tracks. Um, like, look at the path that piece of that specific piece of software has been on over the years. Like, it's just been getting better and better and better and better at doing that. So it, it's normal that that would eventually happen. Software has been getting better. You know, like we didn't, we didn't, we were not born with Fruity Loops. You know, we had to use fucking acid for all of our loop based production. Um, and it was terrible by comparison. And you'd still have to go to a studio because you couldn't master it and you had to do this, you know? And, and so like the idea that all of this stuff just eventually got better is just in a lot of cases, just the way that software is going to develop like FL studio, the modern fruity loops also now has some kind of mastering solution that they try and they're trying to bill it as that because that's the buzzword, right? Like, oh, you can do AI based mastering inside of FL studio now. And you're like, okay, cool. Logic has it. Like all of the major audio production platforms 
have much, much, much better mastering solutions than they used to. And I guess like my point is don't throw them aside just because they all feel this disgusting need to refer to them as AI based. Cause that's ridiculous. That's like, that's like saying that, uh, when you download a bunch of, uh, reverb, uh, what are they called? Impulses for like, this is the type of reverb I'm, I'm wanting to use. And you download a bunch of, or like, uh, mic simulators. There is mic simulation software that like, you could make the way this mic sounds instead sound like this much more expensive microphone or this this very vintage uh, specific sound and we've captured the sounds of that or like guitar amplifiers like Amplitube where they're like, oh yeah, we, we've got a, a software-based VST that will, will simulate this aspect of this guitar amplifier. Like, yeah, man. That's like saying that that's AI-based because they are building it to sound like another thing. I'm like, eh, it's just slightly more algorithmic as opposed to offering just a straight up file that says, these are the parameters of this microphone. These are the parameters of this amplif uh, amplifier, you know? So I, I don't know. It's, it is annoying that AI has become the buzzword it has become because it is something that is a lot of, a lot of this type of software was going to move forward in these specific ways anyway. But now they can kind of get more people talking about it by just throwing buzzwords. I guess that's always been the way. It's always been the way. Um, Colton writes in from Fort Worth. Yeah, and it's, it, yes, and it's bad for people that make a living doing mastering. Of course, of course it is. Yes, definitely. So it's like, how do you, you know, how do you do that responsibly? How do you have software like that roll out in such a way that, you know, is either going to make sure that people like that still have value? Because they, um, they know a lot more than just how to master, I'm sure. And so how do they apply their trade in different ways? How do they, like, what is the new frontier for them to be on if it's not going to be mastering? Um that's a much harder question to answer. That's like saying like, okay, if we eliminate coal, what happens to all the people that work in the coal mines? Um, and you know, that's, that's a more extreme case than mastering engineers, I suppose. Um, and so I think in the, in the end, uh, you know, when we, when we, think about coal mines. We think about that sort of thing. Like you, you need to provide support for people. You need to, this is, you know, whatever, without getting into the discussion of universal basic income and, um, how you, how you help people who have found their life's work or their, their, their studied trade suddenly become obsolete. What do those people do? Society should help those people is the answer. Society should help those people find something new or, or what have you and support those people as they make that transition. Um, like that, that's probably the much larger answer is it is a societal problem that needs to be solved. It is not like a, not always a hold back the technology because these people need to keep their jobs. It is more like, hey, if technology, if the, if the bullshit march of progress actually destroys these people's livelihoods, what do we do to make sure that they don't fall behind so that they don't fall apart so that they're able to be supported so that they're able to support a family? Uh, like, how do we actually solve those sorts of problems? When McDonald's goes to a fully touchscreen or, or a 90% touchscreen based ordering system, what happens to the people working the, the cash registers? What happens to people in a, in a increasingly cashless society when they replace the people who are cooking the fries with robots that cook the fries? What do they do? Right now, the answer is jack shit. Right now, the answer is like, mm, tough, dude. I don't know. Mm, you should figure that out. And if you don't have a, a big lobbyist group 
or a big political party that is fucking fighting for you and saying, no, we need to keep making coal because coal is because climate change isn't real or whatever bullshit they cook up to keep coal alive. No one is going to bat for the people in the fast food market who will get replaced. No one is going to bat for mastering engineer, you know, like, like it is society needs to step up. Because that's, that's the only way that all of this keeps moving forward. Uh, the alternative is that you hold things back and you say, no, we're going to keep using coal and no, we're going to keep using mastering engineers, which is like, that's a way you could go. But we have to be real about it and say technology is technology. It is going to go in the direction it's going to go in unless you break it. And if you want to start doing that, we can. But I don't think that goes well either in the end. So instead, society needs to be the shim. There needs to be the thing in the middle that actually serves people and helps people and keeps them safe and protects them. From technology, big and small. So, at, yeah. We could then get into the likelihood of that all happening and all of that sort of thing, but that just becomes a much more depressing conversation. Um, Colton in Fort Worth uh, writes in, it says, with the popularity of Roblox with the difficulty and tedium of making games and the bottom falling out in the PlayStation AAA space with their lack of profit, despite lack of revenue, why on earth did Sony not create a vertical pipeline for developers to use media molecules dreams to publish a game on the Sony marketplace and simply take a cut? You've got a democratized tool set in dreams that is difficult to beat a console exclusive and a large platform of players to purchase small games that could generate for Sony basically free revenue. Is there some Achilles heel to this problem? Does it further rot out the Sony narrative game, the live service? What am I missing here? Uh, well, look. Uh, what you're missing here is that there are other tool sets that were already built to do that. Some of them actual game engines. And so the people that were looking to publish a game eventually just said, like, I'll just download the Unreal Engine. And like cut out the middleman. Like I don't need to, you know, I don't need to do this, this sort of stuff. So the stuff in Roblox and, the, and this exists in Fortnite as well. Um, ultimately those are massive platforms already. And so you're taking advantage of the audience that is there. Dreams did not have that massive audience. Uh, Sony, I don't think could have pushed dreams in a way that would have gotten it that massive audience. You could argue that the PlayStation becomes the massive audience, but there are already a ton of small games launching on PlayStation every single day with or without dreams. And Sony makes a cut off of all of those sales, whether they're made in dreams or not. So if you think about the work that would have had to have happened for dreams to be something that would be able to export an executable, that then could go in the Sony store. And then you have to think about the work involved in like, okay, we need to make sure that they didn't somehow slip some kind of malformed image into this game that when run on a PlayStation 5, hacks it, uh, jailbreaks it, does exploits some kind of WebKit vulnerability that has been in the system for years and years. Like there would be a lot of work around that before you could get to a point where you could trust dreams based executables on the platform presumably um i don't think there was ever going to be a large enough community of creators on the dreams platform to make that work worth doing um fortnite is an outlier you know fortnite got big because of the game it was or rather the game it became when the battle Royale became big. And so Fortnite kind of backed into the Roblox model a different way. And so I get, I've, I've gotten pitches from studio. Like there are studios of people set up 
that are game developers that have experience in the triple a space in some cases that have you know made big games made small games made games shipped games that are on steam that are on a place you know on console wherever that now work at studios where they make things that exist only inside of Fortnite and things that only exist inside of Roblox because of the monetization strategies that have appeared around that. Um, but when you say you've got a democratized tool set in dreams that is difficult to beat, I would argue that the democratized tool set already exists in the form of game engines that are out there that you can just get and start doing things. Uh, and have full control over it. Uh, you could argue that it's not as easy to use as dreams. I, yeah, probably, probably. Um, I don't know that I saw anything made in dreams that I would have been willing to pay for outside of dreams or willing to pay for, I guess, period. I saw a lot of neat projects that you go like, oh, that's really cool that they were able to do that in dreams. Wow, that's fascinating. Well, look at this. This is, this is wild. But I don't know that there was necessarily a lot of stuff there that, that, and, and maybe if they had created, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem ultimately, right? Like if, if Sony had created that pipeline and said, hey, you can make things in dreams and sell them on the PlayStation store then maybe that would have then led to more people taking those tools more seriously and doing something more substantial with it or, or whatever. But like, it was always this weird dreams was never positioned to be that. And so it was never something that they, it, it, like when you'd ask them about that, when it was in development, it was like, Oh, are you going to let people export games from this so that they can run them separately or do this and that? There was always like, Oh, that'd be neat. I, you know, they're like the, they, the future was open, but like they didn't, they did not have that vision out of the gate, and I don't think it's it's really possible to add that vision after the fact in a world where a lot of other tool sets exist if you want to make games on a PC or on console or, or, or whatever. Like, Dreams is neat. It's probably not the best quote-unquote engine for making games. Um... And the numbers were never there to justify it. I don't think, you know, like that's something that if, if dreams had blown up and become a huge thing on its own, again, it's a chicken and egg problem. If, if the people had been there, then maybe Sony would have been better incentivized to figure something like that out. If there was demand for it, it's something that probably would have happened. But instead, it was always this theoretical conversation. Uh, when, when reporters would ask Media Molecule or whoever, just like, hey, well, is this something that you're thinking about doing? It was never like yes, the demand is here and our, our community desperately wants it and, and, and we're, they're clamoring for it and the work is there and the quality of the work is there that we look at it and we think we have to do this. Like that, just there, there was never, like those pieces never fell into place that way. And so I don't think it was anything of like Sony holding it back and going like, we're not going to do this because we hate free money or anything like you're, you're positing here. It's more just that like, I don't think that that would have ever happened. Um, if they had tried to make that from the outset and that was the stated goal and they were like hey this is like net your rose version 4.0 uh we're gonna let you make your own games and you can sell them on the playstation store then i think people would have approached it with a different mindset and then people would have had much more demands on the tools and what the tools needed to, to develop into in order to you know feel like they were making something worth buying and you probably would have had just as many developers spend a bunch of time fucking around in dreams. And you're like, all right, we have actual ambitions here. These tools are really cool from like a, a consumer to prosumer kind of range. But we're going to go get Mono. We're going to go get Godot. We're going to go get Unity even then. Maybe maybe less Unity now. But, you, you know, hey, we're going we're gonna to go get the Unreal Engine and we're going to do this for real. Instead of like fucking around in this weird tool set that we don't own that has no, like the end user agreement is not focused on protecting us for, as a business or what, you know, like there was just, there it was never set up to be that. And I think if they had set it up to be that, I don't know that it would have, 
I, I don't know that that ever would have happened just because of the realities of like other stuff you could be using to make games. Dreams is really cool and people did some fun, fascinating work in it. Um, but it was never that thing. Greg writes in and says, how are things going with the mister these days? Do you still use it as often? I bought one today since I saw the pre-builds with the case were back in stock and I'm really excited to finally own one. Yes, I have been using my mister a lot more lately. The mister is an FPGA based device focused on video games and playing of them. If you're not familiar, um, and it's all kind of open source designs. And so a lot of different people make the boards and the, the add on SD Ram and all this other stuff. So basically you, you buy a, a core unit, a DE 10 nano, and then you bolt all this other shit onto it. And then it can play a lot of, oh man, it's, 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 it, it plays an increasing number of games, an increasing number on an increasing number of platforms. Um, it was something that was originally started based off the mist, which was a device that was primarily play used to play Amiga and Atari ST games. And then more and more people have made open source cores that run on the mister to play, you know, I don't know, eight bit Nintendo games and game boy games and GBA games and all the way up to PlayStation Saturn and now N64. Uh, the PlayStation core is pretty crazy how good it is these days um the saturn core it has rough audio but it is getting better all the time the saturn core is is really coming along the saturn core is one of those things that people used to think was impossible uh also the n64 was something that people thought would be impossible given the specs of the hardware itself the thought was that the n64 it would be incapable of of running N64 games in any meaningful way. But the developer that did the PlayStation core and also the, the GBA core before it has been tackling N64 and it's coming along like surprisingly well. Personally, I don't care about the N64 enough to to really keep up with that aspect of it, but uh, I'm more interested in the the happenings of the Saturn uh the Saturn core, I suppose, these days, and hopefully someday someone will put the CDI on there, but, um, you know, it plays a handful of arcade games and that, that list is growing all the time. There's talk that people are working on a CPS three core. It runs cap. That's uh that's the Capcom arcade hardware that runs street fighter three. It already runs all of the earlier Capcom arcade boards, uh, of that era. Like the, the CPS two hardware that played, you know, X-Men Children of the Atom and Super Street Fighter 2 and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll play like, what, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game. Like, that's not done yet. So I, I, that might not, not have audio. But um, there's a lot happening in that scene. And then there's another kind of upstart group of people that are saying that they have a new device in the works that will be even more powerful but like everything they post is like teasers and everything they post is very like, oh, well, this, we're going to do this. And like, oh, are we going to make a 3DO core? Maybe we are. And I'm like, that's awesome. You should talk less in teases on social media and more kind of deliberately about your actual plans because I would be interested in buying a more powerful device if the support for it is there from the developers. Um. But, uh, but they've just been treating it all very weird. Like Mortal Kombat one, basically like someone has been working on getting Mortal Kombat one to run in an FPGA and they are saying, Hey, the mister might not be powerful enough to do this, or it might not be fat. Like the, the Ram speed, you know, like specifics of the, the hardware might not be enough to run this core properly. Um, and so there's a team of people looking to build something that is more powerful in some very specific ways to kind of be able to address more hardware that way, which I'm all for. Um, but again, the way they carry themselves is, is like mildly abrasive in a way that you're just like, all right, like this is, this feels like it is, uh, splitting the scene in ways that is uh, a little frustrating, but I don't know, whatever. Uh, I don't follow that stuff that closely because it just gets 
frustrating or whatever. I bought a RetroTINK 4K, which is uh, right here under this box. Now that's an upscaling device primarily um, for if you want to take a Saturn and play it on a modern television and then upscale it to 4K and then upscaling it to 4K allows you to add a lot of CRT style simulation, be that, you know, scan lines and like, like scan line simulation is finally getting good enough that I'm, I'm starting to be more interested in it. It's been something that I've felt has been really crappy for a lot of years and not, not cool enough for a lot of years. The RetroTINK 4K does a really good job with that stuff. It's getting there, or rather it, it can do it, but people need to come up with the profiles and all of the, the other weird formats and stuff to, to do that. Um, but it also has an HDMI input in it. And so you can, you could hook up a modern device to it if you wanted to like a switch or something, uh, a Nintendo switch, not an HDMI switch. You could do that too, I guess. Um, I have, I got one and plugged the mister into it. Um, and so what that does is it will upscale the mister to 4k and allow for a lot of like the, the retro 4k has like HDR support. So you can brighten up the image before you're darkening it down with scan lines. And like, there's just a lot of pushing and pulling you can do on that image to make that thing really look crisp and, and really incredible. Um, and the retro tank 4k added support specifically for the mister to kind of auto crop the image and get it to the, the right level of, uh, of looking right and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's what kind of pushed me over the edge. It was like, Oh, okay. If it's going to directly support the mister and let me do this, like maybe I do want to fuck with this thing because it's pricey. Uh, the, the, the retro tank 4k is like $750. It's, it's a crazy amount of money. The retro tank five X pro is also a very awesome device for significantly less money. Uh, they will both will triple buffer the Saturn. So what, the thing you'd start to discover when you start trying to play Saturn games on modern televisions and even some PlayStation games like Wipeout XL um, is that there are, there are Saturn games that run in multiple resolutions depending on what you're looking at. Virtua Fighter 2 will run in, I believe, 480i. I could be getting this backwards, but it basically it swaps between 480i and 240p regularly depending on if you're looking at a menu or if you're in game or whatever. Uh, and, uh, modern TVs, when you change the resolution, a modern TV will go, okay, hang on a sec. And it will drop the image. It will resync handshake HDMI, do all of that stuff. And so your image goes black for anywhere from like one to five seconds. And so playing a Saturn through a lot of older upscaling gear became impossible until they started adding this, you know, they're, they're triple buffering the image so that they are by buffering it long enough, they can kind of handle that resolution switch and flip it around and be like, okay, we can, we can do that without the image dropping out. The RetroTINK 5X Pro does that as well. The 4K does it in 4K. And so it's a much cleaner and easier way to play like Saturn games on a modern television. And you have people that are, you know, that are big into CRTs and big into older TVs for playing older games. And as they're tuning the RetroTINK 4K and, and getting all these different profiles and getting all of the different scan line settings and stuff, like many of them are coming away from it and saying like, hey, I don't need a CRT anymore. Like the RetroTINK 4K is fucking incredible. Like it looks as good as, like it, it's, it's, it is going to replace a lot of CRTs in a lot of scenarios with like zero, you will not feel nostalgic for the CRT anymore um, because of how good this stuff now is. And I think that's kind of awesome because uh, CRTs are getting harder and harder to find, right? And so the Mr. and like that whole scene, uh, the, I, the retro tank and the Mr. and kind of all part of this same weird retro scene has been really fascinating. 
and I keep, you know, I have my, I have a real Saturn sitting right here with a SCART cable that I can plug into it and, 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 and do all that up with real hardware. But as the Mr.'s Saturn core improves, ideally it gets to a point where I won't need the real Saturn anymore. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's been a really fascinating scene. I, I hope, I, I would like to see a more powerful FPGA based device hit, uh, that, and, and, and like another class of cores kind of like the, the, the Mr. Stuff has been incredible. Um, and it's really great at playing certain types of games. Someone asked if it could do retro achievements. It cannot. And so that actually like part of why I don't use the Mr. as much as I used to is because I got into retro achievements though there's a networking issue that we saw on last week's Friday stream where I am having trouble getting logged into the retro achievements stuff. And, and it's not, it's not, it's not registering my damn achievements. I played where's Waldo and did not get achievement points for it. It's fucking unfair. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know the, the image clarity and the different things you can do with a uh, retro tank 4k on a modern television is wild. And, um, and it's really nice, but it is, again, it's a highly specific device for highly specific needs. You don't need one. If you're going to get a mister, you don't need to also get a retro tink 4k, which is more expensive than a mister. Um, the mister is really cool. I hope that something more powerful comes along or, or rather like, I don't know, like it, it, it's, I guess the thing I would say is that it feels like the mister scene has maybe slowed down ever so slightly. But a big part of that is because I, I'm not really that into the N64. And so a lot of the hype and a lot of the, the discussion in the Mr. Community these days is about these daily updates to the N64 core. And I'm just like, cool, man, I, I don't, I don't value most of those games <laughs> to any uh, substantial degree. So, uh, so the idea of, of doing that, I'm like, ah, you know, whatever, um, so yeah, I don't know. The, the, the GBA stuff is really good. A lot of the, you know, I, I've been using it more and more lately to look at Amiga games for a thing, um, for hopefully an upcoming thing. And, uh, you know, it's a great way to play Super Mario Brothers special on the old PC 88. Uh, but like, you know, th there's, there was an MSX core in development that was going to replace the old one and be a little more accurate in some ways and be kind of cool. And, uh, and then that seemed to stall out. Like, I don't know the development really continued on that. There's an X 68 K core. That's like pretty good, but could use some more that could, that could use just some more attention. I would love to see the PC 98 have more ways to play whatever weird porno games exist on the PC 98. All right. It's uh, the Mr's cool. Again, these are all devices for highly specific purposes. And there are a lot of ways to skin the cat. I think the FPGA stuff is really rad. Um, but software-based emulation is quite good as well. And the, you know, some people really value save states on software emulation. FPGA can do that in some cases, but not all. Um, and I think there are a lot of different ways to approach that, whether you're interested, whether you're playing on BizHawk and getting your retro achievements or whether you're downloading, I mean, like there's like new Game Boy emulators popping up all the time and just like people, people that are just like, fuck it. I want to make a cycle accurate Game Boy. And then they're going and doing it and like, yeah, fuck yeah, do it. Um, yeah, I don't know. That stuff's all been, been pretty, uh, exciting. The last version of MAME got a rewrite on a lot of its, uh, or some of its laser disc emulation. So stuff like Dragon's Lair runs better now um time traveler that shitty holographic sega game you can play that in mame you always could but it, it, they rewrote it in a way that it, it runs i believe more accurately um yeah i don't know there's just been a lot of fun stuff happening in and around the emulation stuff um next thing i'm going to do with my mister is i'm going to bring in my gun con 3 and set up the emitters on this television because that is a good way to apparently play light gun games on a modern TV. Um, if you're playing, if you, if you, you can hook a mister up to a CRT and if you do that, you can 
get all the right connections to use a, re a real zapper on it if you want. <laughs> it's a lot of hoops to jump through, but uh, I'm not going to. I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to do a, a CRT thing probably ever again, if I can help it. Except in very specific cases, like the arcade machines that I have, where I would clearly, I would need a CRT for those. Ugh. They're all going to die someday. But then again, we will too. That's going to do it for this week's show. Be back tomorrow to play something. Um, I don't know. We'll mess around with some stuff tomorrow. And then uh, Friday, we'll rank some 8-bit Nintendo games. You know the drill. Come on back in the morning. We'll play some video games. Have yourselves a good rest of your Tuesday. Uh, and uh, I will see you soon.